and we're live. Going to uh, post a link to the uh, StreamYard in case anybody wants to join in. I see only <clears throat> only one person there right now, um, but it's but it's posted. Um, how are you doing? Looking forward to your broadcast. Thanks, to Freak. Um, for anybody who's watching this on the other channel, um, just I'm simul simulcasting this on two channels, on my Eminent Reflection channel and my uh, Donald Kronos channel. So um, if I'm if I'm talking to somebody in the chat and they're not <clears throat> visible in your chat, they're probably on the other channel. But um, any rate. So, so the idea behind this live stream—it's unscripted, uh, meant to be a bit of a discussion about <clears throat> the coevolution of technology and communication. For example, um, and and this is how this sort of came up. Um, someone had mentioned. Uh, noticing certain patterns in the typographical errors that somebody was making and uh, asked if they were um, using a telephone. And that's what, you know, <clears throat> sort of inspired me to do this. And I've, I've come across that sort of thing before as well. I've, you know, had times myself when um, I would be able to guess what kind of a device someone is using and what that device is doing. Um, to the things that they're typing or even to the things that they're saying in spoken form. Um, <clears throat> and now, if you're typing something, you might have autocorrect that can change the things you've typed. You might have um, something that filters out cuss words um, or whatever it considers to be, uh, you know, words that shouldn't be said. <clears throat> Uh, the freak says Eric Snowden spoke about this. Uh, yeah, amongst other things. Um, the thing is, well, for example, if you have um, uh, <clears throat> word suggestions coming up on your device, there's a very good chance that the things you're saying are going out to a server, and that server is figuring out, you know, something about what words to suggest and then sending those suggestions back to you. Um, <clears throat> something that corrects typographical errors, the auto automatic spell checking, things like that, a little less likely to be going out to a server, but again, might be depending on how it's set up. And uh, these are all things that can affect our communication. <clears throat> also, when you talk to a computer, when you, you know, use your voice to ask a computer something or give a command to a computer um, that that um, can be affected by your particular accent your particular choice of words um, the freak says uh, he said AI is able to parse all aspects of just typing to identify um, <clears throat> Not sure quite why and quite what is meant by that, but yeah, an artificial intelligence, um, basically, an artificial intelligence can figure things out from whatever input it has. Now they don't have the life experience that a human being has, so they've got a disadvantage in in that respect. Uh, you know, we have the advantage in that. We take a lifetime of experiences into the things we're trying to figure out. But we don't have a brain that works at the speed of a computer either. We we have we have brains that are very good at multitasking and quite slow. Uh, he says, gave example of um, timing between key, uh, keyed keys and such. Yeah, and, and again... <clears throat> that depends on what information the artificial intelligence gets. Uh, yes, yes, my background matches my shirt. Uh, pa Pavel D says, uh, my background matches my shirt. Yes, that was intentional. I, um, I'm i actually wearing a, a green shirt with flowers on it. 
um, and using a green screen behind me. So, um, yeah, um, that was on purpose. And I, I figured it would go along with the, uh, you know, the whole theme of this, um, uh, you know, having to do with technology because um, <clears throat> I'm using a audiovisual media um, to make this uh, this video and uh, how I look affects the communication, you know, body language and so on. And uh, choice of attire in this case um, has been altered by the technology itself. So I thought it was uh, rather appropriate. Mm. Igor Pavlov? Not, not, not familiar. Um, the freak. Not, not sure what that is a reference to. Um, yeah, as far as NSA or other government agencies, there again, like I said, uh, what whatever they might get, whatever information they might get about what people are typing or what people are saying, um, it depends on you know what actually gets sent out there and what of that they're able to intercept. Uh, you know, if you have something on your device, for example, that um, checks your typing as you go and makes suggestions and it's not going out on a network to, you know, to get that information um, and, and you click suggestions on your device and, and take those words, um, you know, that's all happening on your device. So there's, you know, nothing that um, that goes out on the internet that can tell like, you know, did you type that yourself or was it something that you selected and let the device type for you? So, <clears throat> um, also if you, if you have a, an app in your device that modifies your voice before your voice goes out, um, what gets out there on the internet is, uh, you know, is, not going to include your voice before the modification um, if that app is happening on your device. So, um, uh, my nose is bugging me and I hate that because I'm, I'm on screen. <laughs> Which uh, limits the number of things I can politely do about it. Um, and, uh, yes, it's, it's itching me it's kind of limiting me down to zero things i can politely do about it i think other than uh take myself off camera and excuse myself for a few seconds i suppose any rate <clears throat> um about evolution evolution is of course the you know the process of change adding up um now when i say adding up i don't mean it has to be in a positive direction uh <clears throat> subtraction adds up as well um you know negative things can add up as much as positive things can add up bad things can add up as much as good things can add up no in biological evolution <clears throat> generally speaking evolution tends to happen in a direction um that that makes things more fit to survive and pass on their genes in whatever environment they live in and that is you know because natural selection of course you know things that don't survive and pass on their genes um you know tend not to get their genes passed on <clears throat> yeah <laughs> uh, here he says I'll, I'll pay for god to scratch your nose for you yeah well i can do it myself it's just it's just um i prefer not to on screen and uh yeah it's annoying but see that's that's another thing I'm using a communication medium where I'm visible on screen. Um, you know, if, if this was voice only, wouldn't really much matter. Um, you know, my nose is itching because, you know, uh, I could mute my microphone long enough to blow my nose and nobody would really know the difference or whatever. But, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Another thing about, you know, the evolution of technology and communication, something I would very much like to see, and I've actually been uh, working toward this sort of a goal for basically my whole life, 
is uh, for humans to have languages that we use to talk to each other that are designed from the ground up to be easier for computers to understand. Because, uh, you know, the English language is a, is a good example of a language that is notoriously difficult, complicated in all sorts of ways. Did you, did you snort coke before you came on screen? Just kidding. Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> Seriously. Um, uh, I don't even like Coke or Pepsi for that matter. You know, can't imagine why anybody would want to. Never mind. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and that's another thing. Different meanings of, of the same spoken word or different meanings of the same written word. <clears throat> and the, the same written word not necessarily representing the same spoken word. These are all complications in language and complications in communication that, uh, that we have to deal with, we humans have to deal with on a regular basis. And that makes it very difficult for a computer, again, because they don't have the life experience that we have. Yeah, uh, Pavel, you're probably right about that. Um, there are certain things that are probably best avoided being tried the first time uh, because, uh, yeah, humans are susceptible to things like addiction and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, and yet, even if we avoid all such things, our own biology gives us trouble. I mean... There's just no way around it. So, yeah, I mean, we, we have to deal with, with the physics that we're born into and the biology that we're born into and and uh, also the technology that we're born into. <clears throat> and while the physics seems to be pretty much constant, uh, the biology changes very slowly and the technology is changing quite rapidly mm. yes yes harry too much too much of anything can be bad this is true um yeah even even air and water can be can be dangerous too much air pressure uh too much water like if you if you're if you're drowning in it that's a bad thing um i mean those are rather simplified examples but yeah too much of anything can be bad i agree that's i guess that's why it's called too much <laughs> now where does that come from too much too t o o uh, a word that um in some cases means excessive and in some cases means also um, much being a word that uh, refers to quantity so excessive quantity too much um, but we know what it means I mean uh, you know fluent English speaker generally knows what the word too much means <clears throat> that reminds me of a uh, um, when when people learning the Spanish language um, ask como mucho as a question, um, a translation of the English, how much? And it comes out sounding like I eat a lot. Um, como in Spanish is uh, the first person present form of the verb comer, meaning to eat. Uh, mucho is, of course, uh, pretty much identical to the English word much not quite identical but pretty close to it and uh, so yeah yeah in Spanish mucho and in Italian molto yes um, molto is one uh, molto is another um, oh I'm trying to think which variations are in which languages uh, now in Esperanto um, the word changes based on the ending. So 
Multo would be a noun. Multa would be an adjective. Multe would be an adverb. Um, multas would be a present tense verb. Um, multis would be a past tense verb, and multos would be a future tense verb. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things um, I've spent a good portion of my life working on is taking that sort of, oh, muito, yeah, in Portuguese. Yeah, muito. Um, <clears throat> taking that sort of that sort of uh, word formation into into other languages or taking the languages into that. Uh, yes, yeah, me me povas parole esperanto. Yes, I I can speak esperanto. Um, I wouldn't call myself fluent at it um, for the simple matter of fact that I. I lack sufficient practice, and uh, <clears throat> that has to do with um, Esperanto speakers uh, being few and far between, so to speak. Um, I would say there's probably 10 or 20 million active Esperanto speakers in the world, and um, they're scattered all over the place. So if you live in say, a small country that has an abnormally large number of Esperanto speakers, you might have a pretty decent chance of running into one. If you live in a large country with an abnormally small number of Esperanto speakers, your chances of running into one are quite slim. And uh, the United States of America fits that description. So, yeah, I don't um, have a lot of Esperanto speakers around where I live. 20 million. Yeah, I think that's probably a decent estimate. It's hard to really say for sure because the number of active speakers, of course, goes up and down depending on who's using it and how much using it you consider to be active. Um, I think there are people who estimated the number of active speakers as low as 2 million and uh, others that might estimate it as high as 100 million. I think the 100 million is really pushing things. Um, <clears throat> but there again, it's a question of what do you mean by active? You know, do you mean used on extremely rare occasions or do you mean, you know, actually conversing with people on a regular basis or somewhere in between? And uh, no, um, the uh, Esperanto course on Duolingo, of course, has brought. Um, a lot of people into being able to use the language and uh, <clears throat> it is it is a, a, a quite useful language um, I would say its biggest downside and this is my personal opinion but uh, in my opinion the biggest downside of the Esperanto language is the letters with hats and that again has to do with the evolution of our technology along with the evolution of communication. Uh, when Ludovico Lazar um developed the Esperanto language, uh, printing presses were a relatively new thing at the time. And so he considered printing presses and thought about the fact that, you know, maybe, you know, somebody might not be able to get a hold of or make the letters with hats on them, so to speak, you know, what, what they call letters with hats. Basically, they're, they're letters with accent marks. And um, so he had a workaround for it that he put in his original publication where, uh, for example, the, the C with a carrot symbol over it, um, the, the letter CHO, you could write as CH. And so it makes the CH sound like in the English CH, which... For an English speaker, that might make perfect sense. Um, for a speaker of a language that that um, maybe, for example, like um, oh, I think Italian, it seems to me in Italian, uh, the C makes the ch sound and the CH makes the k sound, um, if I'm not mistaken. So it's completely the reverse. But uh, it depends on what the language is. And I've got bits and pieces of so many languages in my head, I mix them up. So I might get my, my data wrong about any given language. I, I'm <laughs> a little hesitant to uh, say things like that about any particular language for that reason. Uh, Pavel says I'm correct. Thank you, Pavel. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, 
<clears throat> a lifetime of, of studying something and it's just so much information that it's 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 overwhelming and you get to the point where uh, <laughs> you know you mix them up and it's it's difficult not to um, <clears throat> But yeah, uh, the Esperanto language has uh, 28 letters in its alphabet. Um, of those 28 letters, I think there are six of them that have hats. There's, uh, let's see, there's the C with the hat, the, the letter Cho. Um, the G with the hat, which is the letter Jo. Um, the H with the letter hat, which is the letter Ho. Um, the J with the hat, which is the letter Jo. Let's see, C G H J. That's four. Um, the S with the hat, which is the letter Sho, and the U with the hat, which is the letter Wo. Now, the only one of them ha that has a different accent mark than the rest is the the letter Wo. Um, that has. Uh, I think it's called a brev mark it's it's got it's like a u with a little tiny u above it as opposed to the other the other six of them the other five of the six um have the like a carrot symbol on top of them and um <clears throat> now in my in my own language family based largely on a spare um I've avoided that because, uh, you know, modern technology at the time I was making it, um, you know, at the time I was working on my languages, modern technology um, was a lot different than when uh, Zamenhof had, had made the Esperanto language. And <clears throat> so instead of having to deal with the possibility that somebody uh, might not be able to have those letters on a printing press, a physical printing press, where you, you know, take physical letters and line them up on a plate, on a, you know, on a piece that you put inside the press physically and, and literally press the uh, ink onto the paper. Um, you know, you run, run an ink roller over the, over the letters and then the letters get pressed onto the paper to, to um, print them. It's a different kind of technology when you're working on computers with a computer keyboard. And of course, you know, at the time that I was working on it, most of the computer keyboards, I'm pretty sure, and I don't know for certain, but m my understanding is most of the computer keyboards around the world um, handled uh, the English alphabet. The, you know, there, there, weren't, there weren't very many international keyboards or anything like that back then. This was a long time ago. I'm not sure if there were any at all, actually. Um, of course, you know, computers did exist in non-english speaking countries and they had to have their ways of working around things but keep in mind this is not long after um the time when there wasn't such a thing as a computer keyboard when you know you you put data into a computer through things like punch cards so you know technology has has evolved quite a long way since then now um the um, the sound cho, by the way, from the the C with the hat on it, is actually um, it's a plosive, uh, it's a it's a fricative plosive, and it's it's kind of a blend of uh, like a T sound and an SH sound. So if you write T S H um, in English, um, you'll get the same sound. If if you if you were, for example, to write um, well, like the spelling of the letter Cho in in uh, Esperanto, of course, would be uh, C with a hat on it, and then the letter O. If you wanted to write that in English, you could write C H O. And <clears throat> if you wrote T S H O, you get the same thing. Um, some people might pronounce the two of those slightly different from each other, but basically, you end up with the same um, plosive blend. Now the letter the letter C and the, the English letter C take that same letter and bring it into Esperanto the written letter uh, that's the letter so which makes a TS sound again it's technically two sounds it's a blend um, of a, a plosive and a fricative the plosive t and the fricative s um, so in Esper I would just write that as TS 
and in a spare the C makes the sh sound uh, just like in Italian and uh, so to make the English CH sound I would just write that as uh, TC and that's t -sh. so it's a <clears throat> a little different system now of course if you're if you're working on a computer that has uh, say Cyrillic a Cyrillic keyboard and no English letters on the keyboard at all then having all English letters and I say English letters technically they're Latin but um, you know there's the English letters are like a subset of the Latin alphabet without any without any accent marks at this point although once in a while accent marks do get used in English language um, they're just not standardized in any way but um, if you're working on a keyboard that doesn't support those letters then if you need to use those letters you got to have a workaround so then we run into that again and if you're working on a touch screen device like a telephone with a touch screen um, and an on-screen keyboard then of course that keyboard can represent any set of letters you want to have it represent um, I have a whole bunch of different keyboards installed on my telephone what language uses Cyrillic or however it's spelled um, well let's see uh, um, well Russian uses Cyrillic as one um, I it's I'm not sure but I think the Greek letters do they qualify as Cyrillic I'm not sure um, I should know that uh, again it's so much study and it, it just you know over the years it just gets to be overwhelming and then you get to the point where you're not sure what you know and what you think you know and but um, yeah definitely Russian uses Cyrillic um, there are there are uh, variations on Cyrillic and I think I think well, I'm gonna just run a web search and see here I'm, I'm gonna just share a screen and let's see um, share screen I want to just share the one that I'm looking at right now the, the one that I've got my stream yard in so that and share and uh, open up a, a tab and I'm just gonna run a search for um, uh, let's see languages that use Cyrillic yeah, how do you spell Cyrillic? C Y R I L L I C. And um, see languages using Cyrillic. And let's see, numeric Cyrillic alphabets. Uh, numerous Cyrillic alphabets are based on uh, the Cyrillic script. The early Cyrillic alphabet was developed first <clears throat> in the first Bulgarian Empire during the ninth century A.D. This is just what what Bing search brought up um, by default. <clears throat> in all probability, in Ravna Monastery at the uh, Preslav Literary School by Saint Clement of Ohrid and uh, Saint Naum, and replaced the earlier um, Glagolitic script developed by the Byzantine theologians um, Cyril and Method Methodius in uh, probably in Polycharon um, here just open the page Cyrillic script and let's see is there a list of languages Cyrillic alphabets here we go Cyrillic alphabets uh, Slavic languages non-Slavic languages and is Greek in here? I'm just running a real quick. Yeah, Greek is listed here following Latin Greek, but is it listed as Cyrillic? Um, let's see. Parent, um, proto, uh, let's see, Phoenician, Greek script, uh, Glagolitic, Cyrillic. Okay, so so Greek is a, um, a, a an ancestor of Cyrillic script. That would explain why I wasn't so sure exactly what the status was on that and so I will go ahead and remove this um, screen share but um yeah uh, 
you know, I, 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 I hesitate to call myself an expert in anything. And I feel sorry for, for people who do call themselves an expert in anything because it's, it's a hard thing to live up to. Um, I have been called an expert in lots of things by various people at various times. And I don't really care to have to live up to that. I mean, I prefer to just do the things I can do, trying to make the world a better place, you know, make, make some progress for humanity. And, uh, <clears throat> you know what what i can manage to do settle for it um you know I, i've i've got a i've got a book i would like to get published soon um i i keep putting it off um seraphim hyde says oh, i missed a lot of this was looking forward to it hello well it hasn't really really been a lot talked about yet i'm just kind of beating around the bush about things, I suppose. Um, you know, I, I'm not really sure what all to say, but uh, I do think it's an important topic. If anybody wants to join in here and discuss things, I'm much better in dialogue than monologue because, um, you know, other people's, other people's thoughts are inspiring to me. My own thoughts are just, they're already there. So I don't tend to be inspired by my own thoughts all that terribly much <laughs> but um yeah i was talking about uh for example how um the esperanto language um uh, was was designed to work with the technology of the time um since uh of course you know typewriters i, I don't think typewriters were a thing back then um and so you know that there was no need to deal with that if, if there was if they were, well, even then, uh, easy enough on an old-fashioned typewriter, if you want to put a, a caret symbol over a letter, just type the letter backspace and type the caret symbol, or type the caret symbol backspace and then type the letter. Either way, you get that. So it wasn't a difficult thing. Um, putting those those hats on the letters, so to speak, um, <clears throat> allowed... Zamenhof to make an alphabet that made more sense to him. That, um, for example, the letter C uh, made a t sound like a TS um, when it didn't have a hat on, and then you put the hat on, and it makes such sound like TSH uh, from the English. And uh, the letter G made the G sound uh, like a hard G when when used without a hat and then you put the hat on it and you get the j sound which is like a, a d and a, like a french j, j. <clears throat> listening at 1.75 speed to get caught up oh i didn't know you could do that i didn't realize you could yeah that makes sense um i i think i've tried that before when someone was live streaming and i was behind on it and and the option seems to me there was no such option. So maybe that's a new feature that's been added. Um, or maybe I'm just mistaken. But there again, you know, features do get added. That is part of the evolution of the software and, you know, part of the evolution of the technology in general. And uh, that is, that is of course, what this uh, stream is meant to be about is the co-evolution of communication and technology and uh, You know how the evolution of one affects the evolution of the other now, of course Anything that evolves in an environment with something else that is evolving <clears throat> They're likely to affect each other's evolution because They are a part of each other's environment and this is something that's seen a lot in biology and nature where, um, you know, species evolve side by side um, in, and diversify side by side. And, uh, you know, one species will diversify into a, a genus um, with many species in it. Well, maybe, you know, the other one might uh, might not branch off at all. Maybe it just changes in a, in a more linear form and... Uh, none of the, you know, none of the other branches survive, but <clears throat> um, regardless, they, they will tend to affect each other, and how one evolves will tend to affect how the other one evolves. Um, 
if you have something, for example, like the crocodilians, which aren't really all that diverse um, and uh, tend not to uh, not to change forms an awful lot over very long periods of time, but they're very effective predators. Um, you know, that's likely to affect other life forms evolving around them because, uh, you know, they're, they're very good at what they do and they're very good at surviving in the environment that, um, <clears throat> that they're found in. So, um, yeah, uh, about the, the Asper language I was mentioning earlier. Well, it's a, a spare language family more accurately. Um, Esper was uh, something I, I built based on the Pont language bridging system and the uh, Esperanto language. And so it's based on Esperanto to a large extent. Um, it has a 26 letter alphabet instead of 28 letters like Esperanto does. It uses the same 26 letters as the English alphabet and no accent marks. Um, although in uh, in, in, in a derived language within the Asper language family, uh, accent marks can be used. There is also the option uh, to use a Cyrillic alphabet, um, but it would, of course, have to be adapted for that. And these are things that, you know, I've worked out details on over the years and lost the details <laughs> and worked them out again, lost them again. Um, I find it to be an interesting exercise to have to repeat such things and see how close I think I end up to what I had at a previous incarnation of it, so to speak. Um, the, the first Esperanto phrase I ever learned was Lakato Curas. Um, if I, I can post that over in the chat, uh, in the live chat, La Cato Curas, and I'll put in the English equivalent of that. The cat runs. <clears throat> um, the way that the way that works, the word "la," of course, is the equivalent of the English word "the." Now, where some languages have um, a masculine and a feminine, and sometimes a neuter and maybe an epicene definite article, um, Esperanto only has one, just like English. It's just the single word. In this case, it's the word "la." Uh, kato, of course, K-A-T, that's your root word, cat, and the O on the end of it makes it a noun. Uh, kuras, uh, kur is the root word meaning run, and then the as ending makes it a uh, present tense verb. So if I wanted to write that in espere, uh, I would use the exact same letters. Uh, if I'm writing it un informally, I would write it just like I did in Esperanto, um, that is, you know, informally, meaning basically if I want to just simplify things and not be as precise about it. But if I, <clears throat> if I wanted to write it in, uh, if I want to write it formally, if I want to be as precise as I can, then uh, I would actually add an apostrophe before the word ending on each of those words that has a word ending. And that shows where the stress is. The stress comes at the uh, at the end of um, the word stem, and then the word ending is the last thing that comes after the word stem, and the word ending itself is de-stressed. So I'll post that in the chat as well, uh, Lakato Kuras. That is uh, how I would write that in the language Esperanto Spare, which is uh, the Esperanto um, dialect or the Esperanto based language within the Espera language family. And uh, <clears throat> if I, if I, let's see, if I could type that in the chat, ESP, E-R-A-N-T apostrophe, and then E-S-P-E-R apostrophe, Esperant, Esper, um, that is the name of that particular language. Now, Based on the English language, um, English, well, we pronounce it ing uh, as if it's ing, and I don't know why. I'm, I'm sure that varies from one English dialect to another. 
Uh, I don't think I've heard I don't think I know of a particular dialect of English or accent of English where it's commonly pronounced English or English, either of which would be more phonetic. But um, but in uh, in the Asper language family, there is one E N G L I C apostrophe English, uh, and E S P E R apostrophe. Um, that's that's the language English Asper. It's N Glish, not Ang not Ang Glish. Um, the E N is pronounced N and the G L I C is pronounced Glish. So N Glish Asper. And in N Glish Asper, if I um, if I wanted to type that same phrase, I would type La Cato Runas. And run, of course, is just the English word run. Oops, I, I capitalized that. Why am I capitalizing that? Let me do that over again. L-A space K-A-T apostrophe O R-U-N apostrophe A-S period without the caps. And should I delete those other ones? I don't know how that, if I if I delete them, um, I don't know if, if they'll show up on the, on the, on the replay or whatever, and since I've already mentioned them, I, I guess I'll just leave them there. But um, Lakato Runas would be the cat runs <clears throat> in English Asper, in English Asper. And if I wanted to type it in Espanol Asper, which is uh, the Spanish ba based version of uh, the Spanish based language within the Asper family, I would type. Lakato Corras. Now, it's not been totally standardized. I'm typing it with a double R, and that is specific to the uh, Espanol Esper um, language. Uh, the double R would normally just be pronounced the same as R twice. <clears throat> um, in Spanish, double R represents a rolled R, and things like that are are allowed in the Asper language family. That um, if you have a sound that needs to be represented in order to be clear, or should be represented in order to be clear, um, if you have to, you know, use a letter with an accent mark uh, that was already in use in that language, or um, you know, double up a consonant in a way that it works within that language. Um, such things can be done. But um, how much of that should be done, I don't really know. And this is where, you know, I don't I don't really like having to develop a whole language family for humanity by myself because this is something that humanity should be doing, not one person who has, you know, uh, limited skills as a polyglot and... Uh, has a hard time remembering, you know, being able to keep separate um, what stuff is from which language. Um, yeah, too many, too many different languages. It gets difficult. Any rate, um, oh yeah, I'll repost the uh, Streamyard link. Um, let's see, how do I pin that? that there and let's see um, I okay I can click show on that and that'll put it on the screen I haven't used that feature before and yeah if, if I if I want to pin one of those I guess I would have to open the uh, individual um, live stream for each one and um, hold on give me a moment
So click on this and make sure it's muted when I get in there. Hold on. Give me a... There. I had to mute it. It wasn't. And then I can click on this and pin message. There we go. Okay. So Sarah from Hyde says, trying to get caught up on the video. Cool. Um, and let's see. Um, Okay. Hopefully that works. Yep. And then I can pin that in the chat on that one also. There. So message pinned. So it tells me. Now how do I how do I unshow that message, I wonder? Uh I guess I could just leave it up there. It ain't hurting anything. Um, is it? Yeah, it's still showing. Oh, I see. There's a there's a hide thing on it if I want to do that. So, yeah. Um, my learning in here also. Um, you know, learning how to use live stream. That, that's, that's also evolving. <clears throat> So, um, Sarah from Hyde is catching up, and I'm posting stuff in the chat, which isn't going to make any sense um, if the chat is being seen before <laughs> I get to the point in the video where, where I explained it. Um, so, there's that. Um, at any rate. Does anybody have any any questions, any suggestions for you know direction to take this in? Um, if anybody wants to say anything in the live stream, um, oh, chat users can dismiss it also. Oh, that's right, uh, individually on their individual screens. Well, but uh, yeah, the one I was talking about dismissing was uh, uh, the one I've got like up on the screen itself. Does that? Yeah, that doesn't come up in the chat, so that's just part of the video. And, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, if anybody wanted to type it in manually, it's it's there on the screen to do that. But, um, well, that one's not so bad. I noticed it, it doesn't have any, like, a capital I or a lowercase l, which, of course, those are, you know, difficult letters to tell from each other in some fonts. That's that's another thing with you know the the uh, evolution of communication um, that you know that we've ended up with you know like in some fonts the digit one the letter capital I and the letter lowercase L can be practically or even completely indistinguishable from each other and uh, that's an issue now. Um, you know, it, it, in some circumstances, it really doesn't much matter because the context gives it away. It doesn't much matter, you know, to a human being. If you have a computer trying to do uh, optical character recognition, um, it can be more of an issue to the computer because they don't, again, they don't have the uh, life experience that a human being has. Go to the beginning of the stream and it works. Okay. Um, mm. Oh, the um, okay, the uh, the speed, the okay. So so if you so if you go all the way back to the beginning of the stream, then you can then you can set your uh, the speed to to view it at a higher speed. Interesting to note. Thanks, uh, Seraphim Hyde. I appreciate that. Yeah, stuff to learn. 
and uh, yeah um, now will that change over time it might now another thing I know um, if you if you upload a video like this where you've got uh, a live stream going on on the video um, if you edit that video if you go in and you like trim the the beginning off the video or something like that like some people will they'll put like a countdown on their video before it starts or um or they'll um start the live stream like a while before they begin the stuff that they actually want in the live stream to give people time to uh join in so they've got more of an audience if you go and you trim that stuff out um, then it won't show the live chat uh replay along with the video so and again that might be something that might change in the future but that is the way that it's currently set up in in youtube <clears throat> so i guess i can i can go ahead and remove that um i can put it back up later i suppose but yeah oh i could have done this here uh when i was talking about the uh i'll go back over this stuff um let's see uh lakato curas uh the cat runs that's um esperanto uh lakato curas and um, if I go to the Esperanto, Esperanto spare language and show the equivalent of that, um, let's see, that would be here, uh, Lakato Curras with the apostrophes. And again, the apostrophe is optional. Um, it is there for clarification. That is uh, a formality. It's not a pronounced character, but what it does is it tells you where the stress is in the word and uh, clarifies uh, what part of the word is the word ending. In this case, the O in kato uh, makes it a noun, and the as in kuras makes it a present tense verb. And likewise, in uh, English, a spare. Um, the sentence, the equivalent sentence would be Lakato Runas. Uh, there, like that, Lakato Runas. And again, you could leave the apostrophes out. Uh, under certain circumstances, that might leave it a little ambiguous as to how to read it. So, um, you know, I would recommend using the, um, the formal writing style. Uh, especially if you're, you know, if you're publishing something in the language. Not that I think anyone ever will be publishing anything in the spare language, but could happen someday. <laughs> so, yeah, if that ever happens, uh, I, I recommend using the formal spellings when you're publishing. Um, if you're writing something where you know that um, a particular word could be taken more than one way, you might want to, you know, use the formal form to avoid that <clears throat> and let's see where was the espanol espere um i did put that in here somewhere right yes here it is um espanol espere um i'll add that to the chat also the spelling of it espanol espere That's that's Espanol Espere, which is the Espere language uh, based on Spanish. Uh, essentially a con language. Yes, it is a, a constructed language. Um, Esperanto is a constructed language. Espere is a family of constructed languages. It's a, it's a constructed language family, technically. And in Espanol Espere, that same sentence, uh, the cat runs, um, would be La Cato Corras. And that's corj, corj, ah, I can't, I can't roll my R's very well. Lakato corjas with a rolled R, <laughs> not the trilled R. Um, 
and because in Spanish um, there are words that are distinguished by do they have a single R or a double R and um, the, the double R is rolled the single R is not now in the Spanish language uh, in dialects that I know of in Spanish anyway I'm not sure there probably are exceptions but dialects I'm aware of in Spanish um, the R is also generally rolled if it is at the beginning of a word or maybe it's the beginning of a sentence it might vary from one dialect to another um, <clears throat> in in Espanol Espere it would depend strictly on what's written so if it is a single R you would not be rolling it even if it is in a position where you would in Spanish uh, you would pronounce it as a single R if it's written as a single R and as a pronounce it as a double R if it's written as a double R. Um, the spare alphabet in and of itself doesn't account for having a different pronunciation for a double letter than for a single letter. The double letter would simply be the letter pronounced twice um, as best as you can manage to do that. And how that's going to sound will, of course, depend on the speaker. Uh, in the case of <clears throat> using a language as as a source language um, that has such things, that has, you know, um, double letters pronounced a specific way for that language, um, there, is, there is a process that needs to be worked out to bring a language into the Aspire family, to make an Aspire language out of a source language. And... That's where the point language bridging system comes in. There are certain, basically, rules for doing such a thing. And uh, some of the rules need to be invented, at, you know, in that particular case. Um, yes, all the way to the beginning of the stream. Got it. So, <laughs> um, so now I know how, how close you are to uh, um, caught up. Um, talking to Sarah from Hyde in the in the live chat there um, who won't hear me say that for a few more minutes now at least <clears throat> and by then we'll be almost completely caught up so um, French Asper would be another language in the Asper family French Esper. Oh, um, did I type the uh, Spanish one? I think, yes, I did, and I goofed. I have to correct my Spanish. I, I know I put it in there. Okay. Here. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead with the French spare one first. Um, French is a uh, shot would be cat. So that's C-A-T, shot. And, of course, the uh, the O for the noun ending. So la chateau. Um, oh, what was the French, French word for, for run? Cordier. Okay, C-O-U-R, Cord. I, I, I had to look it up to be sure. So, um, Le Chateau, C-O-U-R, apostrophe, A-S, oops, caps lock went on, C-O-U-R, apostrophe, A-S, and so in the French Asper, The sentence would be, uh, la chateau. Oh, oops. Hide that. Correction. La chateau. Cordras. Yeah, I don't have enough practice in these things. And there it is. That's 
that's the uh, Francis Bear version of the same sentence. <laughs> Fun in French. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I do that as well. I mix up the French and the Spanish and the Italian and a bunch of other uh, so-called romance languages. They've got so much in common, and yet they're so different from each other. Um, I I lived on the uh, border of Brazil for a while in Bolivia, and it was an interesting thing there because uh, people on one side of the border would say, in order to speak Spanish, all you have to do is speak bad Portuguese. And on the other side of the border, they'd say, in order to speak Portuguese, all you have to do is speak bad Spanish. And it actually is not all that inaccurate uh, because um, <clears throat> basically you take the one language and you pronounce it with an accent that sounds like the other language and you've and you've gone a long way toward uh, towards switching over to the other language and then you just throw in a few words that um, you know you you hear people speaking that other language put in place of the word that you know, and basically you've you've swapped the language out. Um, and that's in a way that's sort of how the Esper language family works. That um, each each language in the family is derived from uh, from the core of the Esper language family, um, the, the core language being Esperanto Esper, uh, and um, all of your closed parts of speech stay consistent from one language in the family to another, and then you just swap out the uh, the open parts of speech. So in this case, for example, the, the word cat. Um, in Esperanto Esper, it's cato. In uh, English Esper, it's also cato, uh, spelled the same way. Uh, in the um, Spanish, in the Espanol Esper, and I should I should bring that one up and do my correction on it. Let's see, where did I put Here it is, Espanol Esper. Um, it would be, and I, I, I typed it wrong earlier, it would be Legato Corgras. Like that, um, legato cordras. Oh, um, tried joining the stream and it, it it didn't work. Here, let me let me put the link back down again. It it should still be pinned, but uh, there, that's that's the uh, the link for joining the stream. If you want to go ahead and join, um. Oh no! Yeah, if if you were in there, I didn't notice. Um, come on, come on in again, and we'll give this another try. Hello. Hi. Ah, it works. Oh, again, I'm not very smart, so I won't really be able to offer very much. But apparently, Esperanto is a um, con language, basically. Um. Yeah, Esperanto is a constructed language. Um. Cool. Esper is a constructed language family, and uh, it started out actually as as the Pont language when I was a very young child, uh, which was actually meant to be both a language and a language bridging system. Um, <clears throat> but when I first made it, though, it was it was mainly a mathematics and logic based language. It had its own vocabulary, and I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, and I studied I studied quite a bit of the works of, of, you know, every linguist I could get a hold of, you know, their, their writings. And, um, when I came across, uh, Esperanto, um, I basically decided to use the language bridging system within Pont to replace its own vocabulary and grammar, uh, with the vocabulary and grammar of the Esperanto language, at, at least for the most part. And so I basically turned it into a dialect of Esperanto uh, with rules for how to bring in words and grammar from other languages. I mean, from what I'm reading about Esperanto, that looks like it might be actually pretty easy to do because it's um, made yeah. to be a simple language to learn. I was reading about it while I was listening <clears throat> to you. I'm sorry. Because um, no, I love languages. Right. 
Um, I, I'm not really good with languages. Like English is the only language I know like very well, even not even that well, to be honest. <laughs> I forget words so often. It's ridiculous. Mm. Well, basically, the idea behind the, the font language bridging system comes from English. And I'll tell you where I came, came about that. Um, I actually learned to read at an exceptionally young age. And so when I started learning to talk, um, I was like, you know, how do you say this word? How do you say this word? How do you say this word? Um, you know, because there were so many English words that weren't pronounced like they were written. And, you know, I had a full vocabulary in writing and I was still learning speech. So, yeah. you know, it's like, you know, which 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 spoken word does this written word represent? Because I know what this word means in writing and, you know, haven't figured out how to connect it to speech. So my dad showed me how to use the pronunciation key in dictionaries <clears throat> and, uh, you know, pointed out that they can vary from one dictionary to another. So you have to actually oh, yeah, learn can. that. Yeah. So you learn the dictionary's pronunciation key and then you uh, you look up a word and it'll have like a... Uh, it'll have like two spellings of the word, one that tells you how the word is spelled and has little marks in it to show you, you know, where the syllables break up. And then a second spelling that tells you how it's pronounced. It used and to annoy me that the dictionaries didn't have a consistent or standardized pronunciation thing, though, <clears throat> because I yeah. would like try to, you know, find the I, I would compare the definition of a word from one dictionary to the other. And, you know, the variances in the different pronunciation keys were annoying to me, but Mostly there were words that I already knew how to pronounce because yeah. I live in the middle of nowhere. So, Well, and that's what happens when, you know, when we don't have standardization on something yet. That's like, you know, if somebody asks you, you know, what is the number pi? Well, you might not know the exact value to any given number of digits, but you probably know that it's the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. Well, that there was a point in time when that wasn't standardized. And if you ask somebody what's the number pi... Uh, you know, if if they if they knew what the letter was, um, of course in Greek it's pronounced p, not pi. The you know whole different story there. But I mean, if they if they knew what the if they understood the question, they would have probably responded with what you know in what context. That's true. Oh, and earlier, so I was trying not to p comment on the video while I was watching it. Um, you mentioned. Como um, earlier about uh, which is you know to do with eating, right? Are you familiar with? Are, do you ever use TikTok like at all? TikTok. It's no, a, it's a video I thing. Haven't. So yeah, there's a video some guy with. has of him having a conversation with with himself, um, asking about how I eat. And the whole conversation is just him saying Como to to himself, and it's it makes sense because you know translates in context of how you're saying the word is mm. like it's like. Um, como Como was him saying, I eat how I eat, basically. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Kind of yeah. like the, the word buffalo. There's, there's a complete sentence in English that consists only of the word buffalo. Um, I, think there were, I think there were a couple of uh, pronouns in that, actually. I don't, I'm, there I'm are, not sure, but, but, it, but yes, mainly know, the word buffalo over and over and over. Yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with that. Um, it's something about uh, how, how many... Buffaloes can a buffalo from Buffalo, Buffalo in Buffalo, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it's like the uh, buffaloes bullying each other, uh, bullying other buff buffaloes. It's, it's pretty nifty. It's but it's not you know great that yeah. it's like an well, entire sentence of just the word buffalo. But yeah, a lot of them are you know uh, proper well, nouns. Buffalo, and... buffalo as as a verb basically means like to to pull one over on someone or to you know to, to fool them. So yes, you know, that's what it was. Yeah, and and so a, a buffalo, of course, is referring to you know the the local from Buffalo. So a buffalo from Buffalo is a person living in the city of Buffalo, and uh, yeah, so a buffalo from Buffalo buffaloing buffaloing another buffalo from Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> but it is pretty neat that you can like have a complete conversation with just one word in some context. Yeah, and and yet. And yet it's far from ideal. I mean... Well, it's not ideal. <laughs> and it, it's, it's also, like, if you know the person, maybe you'll get it. But, yeah. I mean, like, with the guy with the Como thing, like, if you had someone who has no context or knows what they're talking about, they're just listening. They're just, it's just like the guy saying the word over and over again for no reason. Yeah. Yeah, there's a... There's a lot of, a lot of stuff like that in human language. 
And I figure if the Asper language family ever takes off, and I don't expect it to, I don't really even want it to per se. I mean, it's meant more to show humanity how this sort of thing can be done because I think it should be done by a team of people, by, you know, mathematicians and, and poets and uh, linguists and scientists and, you know, just teachers and whatever. Just get together a bunch of people with, you know, diverse backgrounds and build a language family from the ground up uh, to tie into other languages to, to basically um, potentially eventually replace the the old uh, naturally evolved languages that we have now with something that would be more compatible with each other so switching from one language to another wouldn't be so um, laborious that's true but the thing about that is is you know a lot of people just don't want to learn a new language or they'll they're they're it's too hard basically is what they're thing there is well that's that's the key to the whole thing um <clears throat> think about why learning a language is hard there are a few reasons for one there is the you know having to learn a new grammar having to learn a new um a new way of spelling thing you know new set of phonetics and stuff like that now if you have something like in the asper language okay the asper language family um every language in the asper language family uses asper phonetics so you learn asper phonetics once and you've got it for every one of those other languages now again you might bring some language into the family that has sounds that are not in the asper alphabet and you maybe have to accommodate them by bringing in a letter with an accent mark or something um so you'd still have to learn those but at least you would have 26 letters and 26 sounds right at the beginning that you've already learned and you could apply from one to another. Uh, you know, that you, you go into a different language in the family and you bring that with you. Also, um, your definite article, la, is the same across every uh, language in the Asper language family. Um, your closed parts of speech, like uh, prepositions, um, are, are going to be the same from one language to another. Uh, your prefixes and suffixes are going to be the same from one language to another. And again, you might add some in, but um, this goes back to in the the uh, the way the the language family works. That if you bring it into one language, it should be allowed to be brought into another language as well, and uh, you know, no exceptions. So. <clears throat> um, that way, you you know, the languages can share parts with each other and, and become more like each other in some ways. So what you end up, once you've learned one spare language, then to learn another spare language, you don't have to learn thousands of words from an open part of speech like nouns or verbs because you already know those words in, in the source language. You know, if you know the source language, you can move over to the spare version of that, uh, you know, the, the spare derivative of that source language quite easily so whenever you're posting the, the the cat runs thing was that from your language that you're making or was that from the <clears throat> other one yeah um well in esperanto it's lakato cura so i was saying that was my first that was the first esperanto phrase i was ever exposed to i i forget what the name of the book was that i was reading at the time but uh i think it was a book but I, I do recall that was the very first Esperanto phrase I ever came across. Esperanto sentence, Lakato curas, meaning the cat runs. Um, <clears throat> now, in in es in in Esperanto, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, L A space K A T O space K U R A S, uh, Lakato curas, and. That that is uh, you know la meaning the uh, kato yeah, la is the cat, in a lot noun. of different languages so uh, I get that, that. so la yeah. um, is pretty much um, you know understood by most people to mean the and yeah and and, and that was the idea so. um, when when Zamenhof uh, made the Esperanto language uh, which he originally named um, la lingua internacia actually it had a name before that as well but it it was earlier in its evolution. Um, I forget what the earlier name was, but when he first published it, it was published as La Lingua Internacia, uh, but he published it under the pen name of Doctoro Esperanto, meaning Dr. Hoping One, 
and yeah. uh, and and the name Esperanto ended up sticking as the language's name. It, he hadn't intended it to be the language's name. Um, users of the language named it that. And when yeah, when even he signed up for like a website that the the article on it mentioned to learn how to learn it. Oh yeah, <laughs> I like learning oh, yeah. new things. Even yeah. though I forget them in five minutes, <clears throat> but I like learning them. Yeah, Esperanto can can be self taught, and there's lots of resources out there for doing so. Uh, and and it's and it's a pretty easy language to learn. Like I said, the in my opinion, the the hardest part of it is um, the the letters with hats. As a matter of fact, I I would type them in and show you, but I don't even know how to do that on this keyboard. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> you know? by the by the hats, do you mean the um just the accents above them in general, or is it all the same accent above an, a letter? Um, I'll show you. Here, we'll do this. Um, bring up another web page. Uh, Esperanto alphabet should come up pretty easily. Yeah, that's what I was looking uh, at myself because I'm on yeah, my there's, laptop. There's some images. Uh, let's see. Esperanto alphabet, sim simple English Wikipedia. See if that one actually has it in, in text. Then I could copy and paste the letters. Um, yes and no. Um, there, here's 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 the letters with hats right here. Um, and if I if I zoom in on this a bit, um, and and highlight, uh, see circumflex and and what the as what what the uh, ASCII code is and and the the Unicode number and yeah, so yeah that's, that's pretty neat that they give you all that. That's the letter Cho. Um, this is the letter uh, Joe. This is the letter. Oops. This, this one is the letter Ho. Uh, this one is the letter Jo. This one is the letter Sho. And this one is the letter Wo. Uh, notice the the U Brev uh, is, you know, it's the only one that's got a different hat on it than the other ones. And uh, I, I, I say I say letters with hats because that's actually what they're called in, in Esperanto. They refer to them as, I mean, um, uh, what is it? Litero uh, um Is it chapa chapeta? I, I'm not sure. Here, try this. That's also um, a really neat way to to you know say them because it's you know explains exactly what they are. They're letters yeah, that look like yeah, hats. They're basically wearing hats. Now uh, let's see if I can remember. Um, so it kind of falls in with the simplified um, aspect of the entire language. T r a d u k u dot net, if I recall correctly. Haven't been there in quite a while. Um, here, letters with hats, and I can translate that from English to Esperanto um, by clicking that button. And here it is up here. Um, here, if I zoom in on this, um, letteroi kun chapeloi. So that was that was the word I was having trouble remembering. Chapeloi. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't sure if it was uh, chapoi or chapetoi or it's chapeloi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's letters with hats, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, you, you know, you, you get terminology like that that it becomes known through the culture, and Esperanto does have its own culture. It's an interesting thing that. It's an invented language, so the culture that it has isn't like the culture of some country. It is literally the culture of that language. Well, once you get people involved, there's going to be culture that's you know added to it as well, and also probably people adding stuff to it to you know involve the language itself. <laughs> Harry says the letters should take their hats off and put on a mask. <laughs> Why can't they wear both? Why can't they wear their mask with their hats on? Yeah, it's yeah, fine. they can have their, they you can can do their both. hat on and wear their mask. <laughs> Why not? You can protect your head from the sun and your in your um your respiratory system from the Rona. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, in in uh, in the Esper language family, of course, I've I've avoided the um letters with hats uh because you know of course when i was making that um you know uh computers were sort of a new thing and uh 
you know, typing typing the hats on letters wasn't too difficult on a typewriter, but to try to do that on a computer where you know you're working with ASCII, and of course you, you might notice those those letters that we were just looking at here. Let's see if I bring that back up. Um, well, you can either, if you're on like a Windows computer, you should be able to pull up the character map, which are, yeah, character map should have it, or you could um, do, I think it's right. like a number lock. But, but if you, if you look at the numbers, those. though, if you look at the these numbers here, mm -hmm. um, and and uh, these these would be, this, this is the, uh, the decimal equivalent on yeah. the end here. The C with a hat on it is number 264. Um, notice that is outside of the first 256 characters. Yes. Um, okay, the first 256 characters, that's that's the Latin one code page. That's where most of the, the Latin characters are, including their accent marks. Notice this one doesn't even fall into that. Uh, none of these fall inside of that. They're, they've all been introduced um, since that first code page. Now, if you go back to before there were multiple code pages, if you only had the one code page, these weren't even an option. And if you go back to before that, uh, when all you had was the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, that only that only allowed you access to characters numbers zero through 127. So accented characters just weren't there at all. That was like an afterthought. And, and uh, <clears throat> so, well, that's, wasn't that's most of it using the um, the the um, English alphabet anyway? So that's why they didn't really, like you know account yeah, exactly. for characters with ac accents on yeah, it. And also exactly. for your language, Esper, is it is the name of it um, inspired by Esperanto, or is it? What, did you think of that name completely before you found out Esperanto? I'm not really sure at this point. I I, I think it was inspired by Esperanto. Um, I'm really not sure because it's been that long. I've lost track. Now the Pont which was the original language, the original language that my Esper language family was derived from. Um, <clears throat> that, that was, that was not because that was from, you know, before I had even encountered Esperanto. Um, but the Esper, uh, I, I believe that was derived from Esperanto. Um, the, um, in, in, in Esperanto, es, es, Espero means hope. Uh, Esperanto, uh, is like an like an ongoing um it's it's a it's an ongoing verb form of hope with a with a noun attached to it it's a little hard to explain that but but um but the anto ending in that sense is is used for people like an esperanto being a person who hopes um, it doesn't have to be um but it just it just ended up that way <clears throat> and in have you considered fair, changing it so that way people won't be um, claiming that you're, you know, just copying the um, Esperanto? Well, that was that was copying Esperanto. So if they want to claim that, that's fine. Um, oh, because you're like okay said, with that then? Yeah, that's I'm what okay happened. with that. Now, the downside to that, where that runs into problems, and uh, like I said, I, I don't see this as something that I think is ever really going to take off. I'm hoping that it can that it can uh, pave the way for something better. But um, where it runs into a problem, though, is a bit of a long story. But to, to shorten it down, um, there is a language that is now called Edo. It is a constructed language. Uh, was originally named Esperantido. And what that name means in Esperanto is uh, offspring of Esperanto. Um, for example, uh, a kitten is a catido, the offspring of a cat. Um, a puppy is a hundido, an offspring of a dog. So Esperantido is an offspring of Esperanto. And uh, Edo just means offspring. So the Edo language is literally an offspring language. That makes and, sense. Yeah, what happened with that is um, after when Esperanto first started to get <clears throat> really popular, uh, a bunch of people got together and they basically said, you know what? Um, you know, this is great, but you know, there are things that we could improve on it. There's, there's room for, for, for improvement. So why don't we, you know, do that? And, uh, so there was, there was agreement that yes, you know, we can, we can make this better. And, uh, I guess the, the general consensus was, 
you know, let's let's make a committee to like direct this to you know to be at the at, at the head of it, and then everybody work together on it. And um, they put the committee together, and the committee just made the changes and then introduced it, and uh, said, you know, here's here's what we're replacing Esperanto with. You know, this is <clears throat> this is the offspring of Esperanto that's going to be the new Esperanto, and. Uh, that didn't go over real well for obvious reasons because uh you know they, they they just gave people a whole bunch of new stuff to learn and not all of it was improvement um also a lot of the so-called improvements were improvements only from a specific perspective of <clears throat> if you were familiar with romance languages and if your linguistic background was not around the romance languages or more to the point if you weren't real familiar with Latin, um, they made it harder instead of easier. Well, that's the thing. Like, people just assume that everyone knows the same thing that they know when they're doing that kind of thing. Um, yes. That's that's why it's really hard to, you know, make people change a language because not everyone learns the same exact way and there, it's kind of hard to find, you know, how each yeah. person will learn the new yeah. language. And Esperanto was meant to be neutral and international and by doing that, they made it less neutral. Uh, although easier for some people to learn. And so uh, I think about a third of the uh, Esperanto community dropped Esperanto and moved over into the Edo community. And of course, you know, for something that was at the time in a, in a vital part of its growing stages, that damaged the community quite a bit. And <clears throat> that left some emotional scars that have held on for generations after that. And so there's a lot of resentment in the Esperanto community with regard to Esperantido, or, you know, that's the plural of Esperantido. Esper uh, offspring of Esperanto are looked down on like, that's a bad thing. Don't do that, which is really sad because if you think about it, I mean, the Esperanto language gets referred to sort of metaphorically speaking a lot in Esperanto as like an oak tree. And this is kind yes. of like saying we don't want an orchard of oak trees we only want one oak tree ever. <laughs> well, because whenever you start adding more to it or, you know, offshoots, like what I wanted to say earlier was, you know, once you start adding people to it and more people talk the language, you're going to have people making their own um, dialects of it. They're going to add yeah. stuff. They're going to add, you know, inside jokes or um, idioms and things like yeah, that. And it happens or meanings for words. Well, yeah, it's not exactly. going to happen either anyway because that's how language evolves. Yep. Yeah, so everybody has their own idiolect, and most people don't even realize it. And um, every 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 language I've ever managed to converse in, I think I've come across the same thing, where you run into people that think there's only one dialect of that language. How many languages English, do you there's know? Some people that think there's only one dialect of English. <laughs> oh no, there's way, way more dialects of English, and. Um, there's like so many different ways to put words. Like I used to work in my, my work. Um, I used to work in our roadside department and I'd never heard this before. I had some guy calling and he wanted, he wanted a hot shot for his car. I'm like, I don't know what that is. I had to get a coworker to translate it for me. And you know, it was just basically he wanted to jumpstart for his car, but he had an accent and I'm like, I've never heard the word car pronounced that way. So I just mm. wanted to make sure I was understanding correctly. Yeah. There's an old joke about that. I, I'm not sure if I could, if I can recall exactly how it goes, but um, something about, you know, in, in some areas they say, uh, you know, I need to wash my car. And in other areas they say, uh, I need to wash my car. It's like, you know, I've heard like, that before too. Like yeah, so, some so people like, here say wash. Yeah. So it's like, it's like the R got lost in one area and moved over into the other area. <laughs> it's just the R just popping out where it's popping up where it's not one. It's like, what are you doing here? Snow. So yeah. how many languages do you speak? Um, bits and pieces of a whole bunch of them and all of absolutely none of them. <laughs> See, mine's mostly English. And when I was trying to re learn another language, um, my school didn't actually have other languages. because like, So you never took Spanish? Mm. I never took Spanish. My school didn't have it. Um, yeah, I did try same, learning same Spanish online, but I mostly learned how to read Spanish. Like I could read Spanish pretty well, but I couldn't speak it. Yeah, because my pronunciation here, but, uh, is shit. <laughs> The grade school, junior grade school, junior highs, and high school that I went to, um, 
didn't have any any courses on any languages other than English. Um, anything well, I wanted to learn about them, I had to learn on my own. Correction, my middle school had it, and then my high school had it, but for high school, it was only for like college prep students, and I was mm. part of the vocational program, which would mean I was meant to go straight from high school to work instead of, you know, college or anything, you know. Well, I could, I could be mistaken, that. but I'm pretty sure mine didn't even have it for that. <laughs> so whenever I was learning in um, middle school, I learned how to count to 20. That's about it. And the, the teens language, are a bit iffy. Spanish? Spanish, yeah. The teens okay. are a bit iffy. <laughs> so but yeah, that's about all I learned there was how to just count. An interesting thing about the number 20, you've, you've heard... You've heard the word score in English used as a number, right? Like four yes. score and seven years ago, that kind of thing. I okay. have. Okay, that, that, is a, that is a word for 20. And um, in the French language, that is the number 20. Uh, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, mm -hmm. six, et, ah, sorry. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, huit, neuf, dix. Ons, douze, treize, quatorze, quinze, uh, dix-sept, 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 dix-huit, dix-neuf, vingt. Okay, vingt is twenty, mm -hmm. but eighty is quatre vingt. That's four twenties. It makes sense. Yeah, so there's no there's no French word for eighty. It's just four twenties, and um, and when you when you go up above twenty. Um, the counting up to 30 is pretty much normal, but then uh, when you reach 30, there's, a, again, um, there's, no, I could be mistaken. It might be, it might vary from one dialect to another, but it seems to me, um, basically, you go, uh, um, like, 20, 29 would be uh, 29, um, 30 would be 20, so it's uh, 2010. And Ventones is is uh, 2011, so <laughs> so counting is very different in in French than it is in English or Spanish. Well, I mean, a lot of the teens in Spanish, I think, are like D S E, like ten and yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, and <clears throat> those are those are remnants of a base twenty numbering system that that our base 10 numbering system uh, is a derivative of. And, uh, and that base 20 numbering system is uh, in turn derived from a base 60 numbering system. So there, um, you know, there are still remnants of those things, which is, you know, that's why we have 60 minutes in an hour and 60 um, <clears throat> seconds in a minute. Uh, that, that goes back to the base 60 numbering system. Apparently, Paul says it changes at um, at seventy, not thirty. Is it seventy, not thirty? Okay. Yeah, and, and again, seventy is basically sixty plus ten. Soixante-dix, yeah, yeah. And again, it might vary from one dialect of French to another as well. That I'm not sure of. I know um, France has been very careful about that sort of thing. That's actually where Parliament came for Parlement, um, which is literally like the speaking. And uh, the original parliament was was designed more than anything else um, as a, a governing body to decide how the language would be written and spoken. I mean, that kind of makes sense and make, make, make things a little bit standardized. Um, but yes, Tobin, um, Tolkien's uh, language is basically, I, I forget the name of it, words escape me sometimes, is a very... Um, well-known um, example of a constructed language. Which one? Uh, Tolkien. I don't remember the name of the language. I should know it because. Oh, like okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tolkien. Yeah, J.R.R. Tolkien made several constructed languages. Actually, that yes. Are somewhat well known out there. Exactly. Um, so he is very well known for it since he's they, they, you know got quite a few of them. They have. They have names like in their own language and then they have the common names like high elven and stuff like that uh, you know the, the english names um and uh yeah um yeah as a matter of fact uh if i'm not mistaken his writings were to a large extent uh basically just settings for his languages 
You know, that, I think, the I think for the, the most well known is the Cimarello. Cim blah, 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 blah. I can't pronounce it because I'm horrible at pronunciation. I've warned <laughs> you. Um, that's, you know, basically a book to, you know, include the language in it for that majority of that book. Um, the, um, the Hobbit and the other books really don't um, include it nearly as much as that book did. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I, I, and I could be mistaken about this, but it seems to me that that um, the the whole world that he built his his writings around um, was designed for the purpose of basically housing his languages, and uh, it, it's an interesting way of doing it. I mean, like you know, take the Klingon language. There are a lot of people who have learned Klingon, um, and that is a language that was designed to be difficult on purpose. So there's an adorable, um, I guess it's a meme that was, I think, on Twitter of, like, this couple, like, they spoke different languages, but they both knew Klingon, and that's how they got to know each other and got married. I think that's so adorable. Yeah, <laughs> it can that's happen. so cute. It can happen. Now, I don't know of any cases where a child has been raised with Klingon as their first language yet. I don't, I, I'm pretty sure there's some kids that have that as a language, but not their first language, because that would be kind of um, cruel and, you know, make yeah, the kid it, basically well, where they're not able to communicate with other children for the most part. Yeah. Well, if it was the only language their parents shared in common, it's not a matter of being cruel. It might be the way their parents actually communicate with each other. In their that homes. is true. That is so true. You know, and so another thing happen. about um, constructed languages is um, there's like a couple of examples in like, um, like I used to do editing for romance novels. A few romance um, writers do that. I know Kristen Feehan does it. She has one for her Carpathians. I cannot remember the name of the other one. Um, mm. Cause I asked her about it and she was kind of annoyed that I knew what a um, constructed language was. <laughs> she wanted it to be a surprise, huh? <laughs> well, she she wanted to like basically make it like um like I asked her what language it was based off of, and she's like, "What do you mean it's made up?" I'm like, "Well, it's gonna have a base. Every single language, that's even a constructed language, has a base. What is yours based off of? What is your grammar structure based off? Of? What is?" And she's like, I, "I never thought about it." I'm like, "I'm assuming it's English, yeah. and she's speaking yeah. English." <laughs> well, that's what I was saying. You know, when when I first made up the Pont language bridging system and the Pont language to go with it, that's where I was. You know, I, I didn't know anything about constructing a language. Um, where I came up with the idea from was, uh, again, you know, I learned to read at an extremely young age. Um, by the time I was beginning to talk, I had already figured out that English was made of multiple languages. Um, I didn't know much about those other languages or where they came from. I, you know, I had so little background on that. And I also understood that English had more than one dialect. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I started reading the Bible basically as, old, as soon as I was old enough to sit. And the oh, King yeah, James a lot of people were surprised Bible, that's, about that's their... not modern English. <laughs> I didn't read the Bible until I was eight, and the only reason I read it was because I read a lot when I was younger, and my family was kind of worried about it because they thought I should, you know, go outside, do stuff, and learn a trade or something. And mm. they basically told me, um, Sarah, the only book you should be reading is the Bible. So they took all my books and they gave me a Bible. I'm like, well, fuck it, I'll read it. <laughs> I, I did okay. read it, and I read it multiple times. I just have horrible memory, so I don't remember most of it. But I do remember, you know, thinking this is bullshit. But it's an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I read it, um, it's 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 kind of a long story. I try to keep it short, but basically, um, my parents figured out that books kept me quiet. You know, while I was still in the crib. And, See, my uh, family never figured that out. Books kept me quiet, but they they're like, <laughs> you read too much, Sarah. You should not read as much. I'm like, well, would you rather me just run around screaming? Well, I, I had this thing when when uh, you know I used to. When I was, you know, when I was a baby, you know, I would cry when my dad left and my mom couldn't figure it out. You know what? She figured something's got to be wrong with me. Why was I crying when my dad left? Well, it was eventually figured out that the reason was uh, my dad was studying Morse code at the time. And I was listening to the Morse code. And when he left, the Morse code would quit. Um, <laughs> but before that got figured out, they, they did manage to figure out that books kept me quiet. And I want to learn Morse code eventually. So, um, so any rate, yeah, um, you know, they got the, 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 the 
thick page children's books and stuff like that that you give the babies and you know they like chew on them like they're a chew toy or something and, and oh, yeah. they fall apart my dad used to say kids you give them books and you give them books and all they do is rip off the covers and eat the insides well i was an unusual kid i didn't chew on the books i treated them like books and I treated them like books, but also I, I feel bad admitting this now. I draw on everything. Like I have to be doing something <laughs> with my hands and my mind has to be occupied with something else. So if I'm reading something, I have to have something to draw on. So I yeah. did draw on a lot of the books. They were my books. So I guess it was okay at the time. Yeah. Um, well, now I've just gotten I'm, to I'm, where when I'm reading, I just have a sheet of paper I draw on. Of course, I'm talking about at an age where you wouldn't where you wouldn't even give a kid a crayon or a pencil and leave them unattended. <laughs> oh, well, I, my family learned not to leave me unattended because I would draw on anything, and I, I learned to figure yeah. out and find all the... Or for that matter, actually, and... actually, probably at an age where you wouldn't give a kid a pencil at all because it's dangerous. Yeah, you know? please don't eat that. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't don't take your eye out with that, you know? So we had a uh, kid, and then he ate the pencil, and we think he has lead poisoning, but we're not entirely sure right now. Yeah. Mm, well, yeah, they don't use lead in pencils. No. They haven't for a very long time. Oh, no, they haven't. That's true. Yeah, it, it was. It was thing. originally they 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 did use lead in pencils a very very long time ago. That's before I was born. Um, but yeah, the modern pencils are made with graphite. It works much better. <laughs> and it's a little bit less toxic. Not much, but a, a little whole bit. lot, whole lot less toxic actually. It's, I know. It's pure carbon. <laughs> exactly. As opposed to pure lead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but lead adds, like, adds extra flavor. But but yeah, you know, I, I I had gotten a hold of dictionaries early on. I mean, basically what happened is is I would get tired of books, and then they wouldn't keep me quiet anymore. And you know, and so my parents would swap them out for different books, and uh, it you know it didn't take long for them to run out of kids' books and. Uh, you know, I, I got dictionaries and my dad's college books, encyclopedias, anything else that would keep me quiet. I, I read all of my dad's college books before he talked. Oh my god, I read like all the encyclopedias <laughs> my family had. My family had the um, like the, the big thick sets of encyclopedias, and I would just mm. sit there and read that. My my family's like, what are you doing? I'm like I'm reading, I'm learning. This is nice. This is interesting. Got more. Yeah, and and so you know, of course, from that, that's like I said, that's where I got my my interest in in uh, other languages and also in how the how the English language had evolved. Um, you know, be, <laughs> don't don't eat lead paint flakes. <laughs> what right, what, what what flavors? I mean, what color or flavor is your favorite? I like the blue ones. What the lead paint fl flakes? <laughs> yes, the blue ones taste the best. I mean, they taste like blue the color, but, you know. It tastes you know. like blue. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that reminds me of, you know, when, when kids are asked, like, you know, you're going to get them a, a slushy drink or something. It's like, what flavor do you want? I want blue, you know. See, that just uh, reminds me or... of, um, I don't remember what it's like. It's like some video on the internet. And, like, these guys were trying to explain the color, the flavors of conversational hearts. And they, like, did all the colors. And they finally got to the orange one. Like, the orange one tastes like orange, the color. And it's accurate. That's that's what it tastes like. It tastes like orange the color. This thing tastes horrible. Okay. It doesn't taste like orange the fruit. It tastes like orange the color. Huh? Yes, orange the color. <clears throat> yes, tastes like orange food coloring. <laughs> and I will, I will describe foods as tasting like that, too. It's like, it's, so what does it taste like? It tastes like blue the color. But English, the English language is notorious for, for being good at bringing words in from other languages. Oh yeah, that, but, we do that a lot. But there's no rules. Not really, no. You know, it, it's 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 flexible enough to handle it, but there's no rules. So like the word. Well, it uh, also it also goes by like the usage. Like they recently added like a bunch of words. Like they added irregardless to the dictionary because people use it so much. Yeah. And they added literally to like the you know pe the way people use literally they added that to the dictionary as a definition because people use it so much because like, languages yeah, the, you know, the, constantly yeah, the evolving. Yeah, the metaphorical use of literally. Yes. The, the non-literal use of literally. <laughs> like for the yeah. longest time, ain't wasn't considered a word. They added ain't to it because people use it so often. Yeah, it's yeah, a logical understood to use. Am not. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> and the word inflammable. Of course, um, you know, was that was a, a word that had two completely different meanings. One meaning able to be inflamed, 
meaning you can make it swell up, and the other one meaning not able to be burned. Yeah. And uh, and those got confused, and uh, people would label flammable liquid containers flammable, and then people would get that confused with the word inflammable, meaning not able to be in. Um, uh, me meaning able to be inflamed or meaning not able to be burned and they take the able to be inflamed part and translate that as able to be made into flame and they would label their flammable container material uh, their flammable materials containers as inflammable that's true see whenever you um i saw the <laughs> name of your of your stream i thought you were going to talk about like the, you know like words like selfie and twerk being added to like the dictionary are being used now because you know they're used so often they're added to the dictionary because you know they're they're words now yeah and and that is that is a, a part of the uh the evolution that the english language has gone through um now see now there have been there have been attempts to regularize parts of the english language uh for example and i forget who who did this history is my worst subject but uh probably not that hard to look up um <clears throat> i think it might have been benjamin franklin anyway there was be surprised. There, there was an attempt to uh make all of the past tense verbs in english end in t <clears throat> there there were you know in in english before American English, um, there were very few past tense verbs that ended in T. And basically, the only reason there were any at all is because words that ended in D or ED, um, but where the D or ED came after, like, uh, a letter P, where it's difficult to pronounce it that way, you know, uh, slept D. <laughs> you know, for example, uh, it gets difficult to pronounce it that way. People would pronounce it as if it ended in T. And so then they would write what they're pronouncing because spelling hadn't been um, hadn't been standardized. And so while they were working on standardizing spelling uh, in, in Britain, you ended up with, you know, all of these uh, words that, you know, the past tense ended in D or ED. And then, of course, the rare exception ending in T. So they tried that to make it so in, in American English, they would all end in T. The reason being, of course, that those where it was difficult to pronounce ending in D, you couldn't switch those to ending in D. So they decided instead, switch all of the ones that end in D to ending in T. And what they ended up with is making the situation worse because uh, it surprised. only personally caught on. So yeah, well, yeah, because people would, yeah, tea. people would do the ones that they found easiest to do, and then just like ignore the ones that were like, eh, it didn't sound right. Well, it, it was more, I think, a matter of just what ended up being common usage, and you know, but common true. usage was competing with common usage. So you would get people who are going out of their way to try to use this new standard and make it common. Well, you've got other people who haven't even heard of this new standard yet. And uh, of course, they're using what's already common. And so one mm -hmm. common was competing with the other common. And of course, you didn't have any, you know, like television news or anything back then to like announce to everybody, you know, that uh, like, you know, here's this new standard. And, uh, you know, we'd encourage everybody to use this so that it can become common, you know. You know, nothing well, this like was in the United States in, uh, in America. And I'm pretty sure even back then, people would be pissed off if you told them what to do. It's like, I ain't oh, and, what the, and there's to. that. Yeah, and there's that. So, you know, so like um, the Hangul um, alphabet, the, the Korean alphabet um, was designed supposedly by one person. And it's a, it's a brilliantly designed alphabet, um, <clears throat> but it was a dictatorship. They could do that. <laughs> so I recently got into one like Korean dramas and there's one that has <laughs> this girl time traveling back to the, um, the emperor that made the alphabet. What was that? So... Um, there's, you know, there's like a streaming service for everything, and one of the streaming services is to have is Korean dramas. So I was watching a Korean drama where this girl time travels back in time to, you know, meet the um, emperor that made their alphabet. Okay. Which is pretty neat. I, like I didn't yeah. you know, like I didn't know that you know one man, <clears throat> an emperor, made their alphabet, but he's like, you know, everyone needs to learn how to talk and do the same thing. So alphabet. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it was, like I said, it was rather brilliantly made. Um, you know, they have, for example, in uh, Japanese, uh, there are multiple writing systems in use in, in Japanese. Oh, it's Chinese uh, languages, yes. The, the, the hiragana is the 
basically the standard Japanese phonetic writing, mm -hmm. and each hiragana character represents one syllable. Mm -hmm. Now, the n sound, I guess you could call that a syllable if you want, but it's more of an ending. And uh, so there's that, you know, sitting by itself. But in general, they, they each represent one syllable. And <clears throat> then the, uh, the katakana is basically just, it's kind of like italics are in English. Um, that's that's like the hiragana, but for foreign languages. Yeah, that's their sort of one for like four languages that they use because they use a lot of different things. I noticed yeah, like recently they started to use a lot more English. Emphasis. But then, mm -hmm. but then, but then they also have the 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 kanji, which is you know the the Chinese characters brought into the Japanese, and and so all these things get mixed together. <clears throat> but the thing is, each syllable character um, is is unique. I mean, you have to learn that syllable character as a syllable. And in the in the in the Korean, it's not that way because your your syllable character it is each character is a syllable, but each character is also a composite and so you learn the vowels and you learn the consonants and you put the two of them together uh you know to to make a syllable character that's pretty neat yeah it is and 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 uh you know like you've got a vowel that goes this way a you know, vertical vowel and you put your your uh you know consonant next to it or you've got a vowel that goes this way and you put your consonant on top of it. And if you need to end it with a consonant, you put another one underneath. So you can have like consonant, vowel, consonant, either horizontally or vertically. And uh, and then they've got some more complex forms that, you know, come out of that for more complex syllables. But uh, but the whole thing is it's, it's constructed. Um, kind of like the way the Chinese pictograms are put together where, you know, you have a, a little symbol that looks, you know, something like this that's supposed to represent the human, you know, it's just like yeah. two lines. And, uh, you know, a little square represents a mouth and, you know, you put these characters next to each other and it can mean like, you know, this symbol and this symbol, you know, with each of their meanings together to make a word that's combining them, or it can mean the sound of this symbol followed by the sound of this other symbol. And so you you run into some confusion, especially when you go from dialect to dialect, where the same symbol doesn't have the same pronunciation anymore. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and the combination of, of two symbols, um, phonetically produces a completely different word as a result. See, I'm going to show how much of a nerd I am. I watch anime, and, like, for characters' names, they'll combine the different, like, Japanese characters. Like, they'll have, um, um, you know, one that's their base, and the one that's the one for foreign languages, and they'll combine them together, and, like, the character's name means something because they're combining those two. And I find that very fascinating, the fact that, like, fans will notice that and, you know, comment on that and figure it mm. out. So, at any rate, the you know the idea with um, <clears throat> you know with the Pont language bridging system, the idea was to mm -hmm. make to make a basically a set of guidelines <clears throat> for how to combine two languages together, or how to mm -hmm. set up one language to bring in components of another language. To say, like you know, if you're going to bring a word in, here are the here are the rules for bringing a word in. Um, here are the rules for bringing a word in from writing in that language, or here are the words, the rules from, for bringing in a word from speech in that language. And to make a whole language that way, um, you, you know, it's better if you, if, you know, when you're making the whole language, because then you don't have to worry about, well, what if you bring in a word from speech and you bring in the same word from writing and you end up with two completely different words, both representing the same thing. Well, of course, if you're going to make a language, you don't have to worry about that because you can pick in advance which way to bring them in. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, what I found is that, you know, taking them in from writing is generally the preferred method uh, because simply because of the fact that the writing tends to be more consistent. Um, <clears throat> well, that and also writing will be how you'll um, do a lot of communication and, telling, and teaching other people how to, you know, interpret yeah. your own language as well. Yeah. Yeah, books books tend to be in writing, not in speech. Now that that may yes. change in time, <clears throat> but yeah, there's a bunch of reasons like that. And the thing is, you, you know, your dictionaries are all in writing, your encyclopedias are all in all in writing. Writing tends to be around for a while. It the written form doesn't evolve as fast. <clears throat> so, excuse me. 
So there are all these reasons why it makes more sense to bring in a word from the writing. And so that's why, for example, taking the English word cat um, into Esper using the Pont language bridging system, um, the C in cat, because it makes a K sound, gets transliterated into a K. So you, you end up with K-A-T, cat. Now, it's pronounced in Esper phonetics. It's written in transliterated English. So you take the tra in the English C-A-T, you transliterate it into a spare K-A-T, and then you pronounce it um, in a spare phonetics as cot. And then, of course, the O ending on it makes it a, uh, makes it a noun, kato. Uh, if you wanted to make it a verb, if you wanted to say, for example, um, I cat, um, it would say mi katas. Mi katas. Yeah, me cut us. That's I cat or I'm catting. Now, if you want to be more specific, instead, if you want to specify I'm catting, I would say me catant. The the A and T ending ant. That's that's the ongoing. Or if you wanted to say I cat, and not I'm catting. If you want to specify more that way, it would be me cutoff. So right now, all three of my cats are catting. They're actually they're napping, to be honest. But that's what cats do. They, they, they cat, yes. Yeah, they the cat. cats cat. La catoi, uh, la catoi catas. La catoi catas. Okay. That okay. makes sense. Um, let's see. La catoi, la catant catoi. The, the catting cats cat. There. Just like an entire entire uh, entire book about cats catting and just different ways to say it. There we go. Um, the the catting cats cat. <laughs> so you said the the um, apostrophes they're not actually pronounced. They're just there to um, show where the stress goes on. Yeah, the it's kind of, it's kind of like a it's kind of like a space character, um, except that it doesn't separate words. It separates. The word stem from the word ending and uh the last syllable in the word stem is emphasized and the word ending is de-emphasized by default so la katant katoi katat so so you don't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable yeah yeah like that <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, that and of course, sense. and of course, the you know the emphasis is always going to end up in the same place. That way, it's always going to end up, like I said, on the last syllable of the word stem. So if you <clears throat> if you wanted to say the um, catting kittens cat, um, it would change that to la um, catant catetoi. Uh, Katas, or katath, rather. Oh, that's pretty and neat. Let's see. Um, did that work? Did what work? I cut um, oh, yeah, I guess that's on there. The katant, the katant katoi, uh, the, no, that's not right. Oh, it didn't, it didn't. I see. It didn't scroll down far enough. This is the one I was looking for. Putting that one on the screen. La katan yeah, sometimes you have to scroll down for the chat to show the last message. Yeah, I didn't realize it hadn't scrolled down. And I'm going, where is where Not is very that? nice to do that. To... <laughs> Thought you broke it, didn't you? Yeah, something like that. Something was it's wrong. Like I broke the YouTube Zonos. Yeah. So, yeah, Kateto is, is, is a little cat. Um, actually, if I wanted to make it kitten, um, I should have, I should have, I, I had meant kitten. I didn't write kitten. What I, what I wrote was actually like small cat. Uh, cateto is a, a small cat. Uh, a catego would be a big cat, like a lion. <laughs> cat, eed, oi, catath. And this would be... Um, the kitten's cat. What? Yeah. Okay. So the um, catting, K-A-T-A-T, 
AMT um, Katidoi Katas. That's that's the catting kitten's cat. <laughs> <laughs> Now, in, uh, I mentioned earlier in Esperanto, the word for dog is hundo. Uh, in, in, Esperanto spare, in, uh, in, in Esperanto spare, it would also be hundo, H-U-N-D apostrophe O. You put the apostrophe in uh, when you're I'm just glad it it's formally. not doggo. <clears throat> in English, it would be. I know. <laughs> Sorry, internet. I'm... There. And that would be. Oops, I got a double A in there. Let me re retype that. See, the only person who notices is that is you. Actually, someone in uh, the, the audience might understand the language. Yeah, I, I have well, no they'd, they'd probably notice. They, they might think that I meant it that way. <laughs> exactly. I thought you meant to do it that way. I thought, oh, sweet. I don't know how to pronounce a double A. Hope it's not rolling R's. Like I can't roll yeah. my R's to save my life. Yeah, how do you pronounce a double A? Um, ah, <laughs> dog. Yeah. You dog. scream. <laughs> yeah, dog. Dog. That would be uh, dogant. <laughs> <laughs> dogant. And. <clears throat> so I was reading Let's your description see. for the video somehow how a few changes in a phrase can make a big difference and potentially leave the result hard to understand and perhaps even easier to misunderstand. I don't remember you going over that. What was that again? Um, I was reading your um, description of the video about how you know a few changes in a phrase can uh, make a difference in how it's understood or misunderstood. Oh, yeah. I, was, I, I think that was in reference to um, you know, like if you've got, uh, um, uh, if, if, if you're, if you're using, for example, voice to text and it hears you wrong, or if you're, voice, uh, chat, voice to text isn't, isn't a perfected thing though. And also, yeah. you know, it's going to hear a lot of things wrong or, um, especially, you know, some words do sound exactly alike. Um, like I noticed a difference, like my, my roommate oh, yeah. loves to use text to speech and it gets the version of their wrong every single time. It's like always the wrong version of like, yeah, well, here's the thing you can, you know, you can teach it grammar, but then once you teach it grammar, if you meant the wrong version, it's going to give you the right one, whether you meant it or not. Yeah. You know, the, it'll give you the one that it learned to, to, to put there to use as the correct one, regardless whether that's the one you meant. And, uh, yeah, here's, here's a, another um this this one says uh la la dogidant la dogidant uh dogidoi dogont and what that is is the the puppying puppies will dog <laughs> well it's kind of like um you know if you you can teach in grammar oh, um and also with the hmm? it's the puppying puppies will be dogging <laughs> <laughs> well then <laughs> But the thing with like the teaching, the uh, teaching and grammar, like I know, um, at, least, at least with Microsoft Word, that's what my my work uses a lot. You know, like you can teach it how you know common things that you use to correct it. Like I used to do that whenever I was writing too. Like with my character names, I could you know teach it to where I type the name in and it wouldn't correct it to something else because it knew that was the name that I meant. Mm. Yeah, those that can actually be taught. <laughs> but but then, then there was also like the thing of someone you know, like like purposely typing like I just did now, like I am on my PC, like different versions of the words. Mm. And, but since they're, you know, words that work, it wouldn't correct you. So people wouldn't know that they're making mistakes because it's technically, um, you know, correct. Yeah. And if, and, right if you teach it, and if you teach it to, um, <clears throat> if you teach it to do what you generally would mean when you don't mean that, it's not going to know that you don't mean that. <laughs> exactly. 
I, am, well, I mean, it can only, you know, learn certain things. It can't <laughs> learn context, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, and, and there again, like I said, that has a lot to do with the fact that the, you know, the, the computers don't have our life experiences, you know, yeah. and, and, and what's more, what's more, you know, languages are lossy encodings you know, human languages are lossy encodings of our thoughts. We, we take our thoughts and we encode them down into something that distills a lot of stuff out of them. And so some of the stuff has, has literally been lost. And, you know, another human being might be able to fill it in from their experiences. And they might fill it in wrong because their experiences might be different. But the computer um, wouldn't be able to fill it in from its experiences because it doesn't have them. And if it's not even <clears throat> if it's not even represented, how would it even know there was anything there to fill in? That's true. So yeah, um, so like I said, what I what I hope with you know with the spare language family is that it can that it can help teach people that this is something everyone can do, and uh, and and that maybe I'll be able to you know encourage humanity to make a concerted effort to come up with a better means of human communication um and oh, and, and, are you, and and to are bridge you planning this for idea. like something like in um, a lot of fantasy stuff where they have like basically a common language essentially um possibly in the very very distant future but not as a short-term thing no I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of like right now we have a bunch of languages that have so little in common, um, and you know, and of course, other languages that have more in common. But I mean, just the whole the whole idea that to learn another language, you have to learn in general, at the very least, thousands of new words, um, and then usually also you have to learn a whole new set of grammar mm -hmm. and a whole new set of phonetics. Um, in some cases, you may have to learn an entirely new set of written characters as well uh, in order to, you know, read or write the language. <clears throat> and in some, and in many cases, you have to learn brand new speech sounds that you didn't know before. And so this is, it's an overwhelming task to learn a, a second language. Learning a third, uh, learning a third language is comparatively easy, but then you've already got two languages in your head and you've got to add that third one on top of them. And, uh, you know, the human brain isn't really well set up for, you know, keeping a lot of languages separate. So. Oh no, especially not after a certain language. age. Like when you're younger, it's easier to learn languages than it is when you're older. But the <laughs> only thing about that is since it's a constructed language, your language is going to be, you know, based off of stuff that you already know. So people trying to le learn your language that don't typically speak. So I'm assuming like, um, from what sounds like your main language is English. So a lot of your stuff is going to be based off of English, I'm assuming. Well, the Eng or... English is fair. English is fair is based off of English. Espanol is, yes. is based off of Spanish. So the idea is to have to, to have the ability for anyone either to have one that's already been set up for them or to set one up in the first place and, and basically make a language that is based on their language and based on, um, Esperanto or on the Espera language system, and uh, <clears throat> and and you know to be able to work with other people to to build a new language that can be used as a sort of a bridge. Because, for example, if if uh, you know if if I didn't speak any English, but mm -hmm. I learned Espanol Espera, and you didn't speak any Spanish, but you learned English Espera. You could speak English spare to me, and I could speak Espanol spare to you, and we would understand a lot of what each other said <clears throat> because we've got the same pronouns and the same uh, prefixes and the same suffixes and uh, the same conjunctions and and uh, of course the same uh, you know definite article. And so there's all this stuff that we share in common. Uh, where the accent is put on the word, you know, where the stress is put on the word is the same. So we've got that in common. We can tell. Uh, you know, I can tell what words you're speaking are meant to be nouns because they're specified that way. You can tell what words I'm sp speaking are meant to be adverbs because they're specified that way. <clears throat> and, you know, so so learning the vocabulary of each other at that point would be much easier because we could hold a conversation 
in a shared base language about the vocabulary. Oh, that makes sense. Now, have you asked people, since your language is um, based off of Esperanto, have you asked people in the Esperanto um, community to help you out with it or work on it with you since you I have tried. wanted different people? I have tried. I, I sort of touched on that earlier where the problem is that um, the Esperanto community in general um, tends to re reject descendants of Esperanto as they're all a bad thing. Um, <clears throat> and it's not everybody, but it's the, the vast majority of the Esperanto community, even if they don't know the story of how it got that way, it's just, it's just like built into the culture that there's animosity toward the idea of, of evolving the language into anything new. Uh, that that makes sense. People do get attached to things and don't like change. And um, like what you mentioned, like the Ito um, part of it, like, you know, it tried to make it easier, but it ended up making it a lot harder for most people. So they're probably just assuming yeah. you're doing the same thing, making it easier for people that well, it wasn't speak even, the same base language as you. It wasn't even the fact that it made it harder for some people so much as, as the fact that what happened damaged the Esperanto community. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that has left this, this sort of lingering taste, feeling yeah. of fear within the community, a fear of any, any offspring of Esperanto, that it's going to damage the movement, it's going to damage the community. And even people that have no idea where that came from tend to share that fear. They, you know, it's, it's, it's been passed on indirectly and unintentionally by other people. They, you know, they have it without even realizing they have it. And it, it manifests itself in some rather interesting ways. That's so, kind of weird because I'm assuming they're not like, you know, directly, you know, communicating to each other. Don't trust, you know, derivatives of this language or anything like that. But like they all just all have this fear ingrained in them since they're part yeah. of that culture. Yeah. I mean, there's a little of both. But yeah, to, I, I have ran into people that had no idea that there was a such thing as the Edo language, let alone, you know, how that happened and and yet had bad feelings about the idea of a language derived from esperanto um <clears throat> even though esperanto itself was a language derived from other languages so you know it just seems kind of counterintuitive that's true but yeah um the way i look at it um you know esperanto did before i was born um, a lot of what i was trying to do early in my life and and that is to make a sort of island between languages that could be used as a uh, like a hub that you could bridge for example from english to esperanto and from esperanto to spanish and then you've got a path to get from one of those languages to the other now spanish is not one of the languages that Esperanto was based on, <clears throat> but it yeah, is the language. Any... I, mm -hmm. It's it's the language I most often hear that it's similar to, and it is. It does be similar with it to it from like the stuff that you've just written, um, and you know, since the guy who made it's Polish, that's kind of surprising. But mm. um, <laughs> with learning, so I did try to learn Spanish, and then I had a friend who was trying to get me to learn Polish. There are a lot of things that are kind of similar between the two languages, to, anyway. Yeah, English was one of the languages that Esperanto was based on, and uh, Zamenhof did not consider himself fluent in English. Um, <clears throat> he, um, he he had learned some English and. Uh, you know, he tried to use the language in making Esperanto as one of the base languages, um, but it wasn't a language he considered himself fluent in. And uh, when the book had to be translated into English, um, he uh, he first had he had one person translate it, and then he had he had English speakers tell him that you know that translation was no good, and so then he had someone else translate it and basically did away with the first translation or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and it is an interesting thing how, how that works because, you know, he had to basically take other people's word for it, uh, you know, how, how good of a translation into English it was, and yet English is one of the languages he based um, Esperanto on, and I've done sort of the same thing because I am not much of a polyglot, you know, I've got little bits and pieces of all kinds of languages in my head, but um, 
you know, and several of them I have been at one point or another in time somewhat conversational in, but no one to converse with. And so they go away. You know, I can't hold on to them that way. And, um, you know, so I'm, I'm not one of these people that, you know, it's like fluent in, in uh, a couple of dozen languages or something. I, you know, I, at any given time, I couldn't even tell you how many languages I'm fluent in, but I can tell you it's very few. I don't even think I'm fluent in English half the time because again I forget words all the time. Um, like I do see it like again you know, it's like I was reading about Esperanto while I was reading like listening to you and I, I see that you know a lot of people are um, you know uh, they're complaining about the fact that it's so similar to the Polish that was used in his region that he grew up in, which you know that's to be expected though like. Like I mentioned before, you're going to yeah. base it off of something that you're familiar with. It has to have some basis for the language that you're creating. Yeah, there are definitely elements of Polish in it. There are also some very definite elements of Russian in it. And Russian is the language he considered to be his mother tongue. Uh, by the way, um, Varsovia or uh, Warsaw, um, which is now part of Poland, was part of Russia at the time. I'd rather not think about Warsaw. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, so, I know. So, but, but, but that's the whole thing. There were like five different languages commonly spoken there. Um, there wasn't any like national language and, you know, there was no, there was no agreement on like, you know, this is the language, this is the one language everybody has to learn. Um, so instead it was, you know, like one community would speak one language and another community speaks another language and a third community speaks a third language. And if the people from these different communities want to talk to each other, they have to speak, you know, one or another of them has to speak a language that's foreign to them and then be at a disadvantage. And there were all kinds of misunderstandings that would happen that way. So, you know, uh, Zamenhof was basically thinking, well, all these misunderstandings lead to all kinds of conflicts. And <clears throat> so if we could get rid of the misunderstandings, we could get rid of the conflicts. And uh, so he figured, uh, you know, one shared universal second language could lead to world peace. And It wouldn't necessarily lead to world peace, but it would be, you know, very useful. Yeah, um, it wouldn't necessarily, but, but that was what he was thinking. <laughs> but I have noticed that when people are learning, like, especially like later in life, like, you know, I'm 36, like me trying to learn um, Spanish or even Polish, like I have learned more strict rules than most people that, you know, speak it natively do. Like um, mm. my friend was telling me like um, in Poland, you know, they really don't use the word I, like they don't use that. But every single thing that I was te learning taught you, taught me to use I. He's like, they'll know you're not a native speaker if you do that. And that's not yeah. something that they do. And like, you know, people who are learning English, like they know really strict rules of English. They use very proper English. Like you can tell someone that when they call in, aside from their accent, um, how they use the language that English isn't their first language, but they've learned it very, very properly and they're very good at it. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing that, you know, what you just pointed out as well, that sometimes if you speak a language too well, it, it, highlights the fact that you're not a native speaker and I, I actually have had people in at least a dozen different spanish-speaking countries um tell me that i spoke the best spanish they'd ever heard well yeah like like whenever i have customers <laughs> like um people who come over from africa and they'll they'll learn english they learn very proper english a lot of them will not use um contractions like they'll say i cannot you know like yeah. people who are like native speakers, like, i can't they speak very clearly and they sound like a foreigner and I like it. Oh, I love the way they speak because they speak you know? so properly. They do use proper grammar. I'm, I love it because I'm I'm in the South and I, I can't stand people who butcher the English language. So it's <laughs> nice to speak to someone who's like speaking it properly and doing it correctly. I'm like, I love the way you speak. I just want to yeah. talk to you like the entire day. <laughs> and this is kind of where I'm coming from. And uh, oh, yeah, Pavel. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Spanish is very simple compared to a. A lot of other romance languages uh the the one exception to that i would say in my opinion is uh the spanish verb tenses because there are an awful lot of basic oh my spanish god there are so many tenses <laughs> whenever i was trying to learn it it's like i'm tired of these tenses it's like they were just like there were lessons specifically like six or seven languages for like just the tenses I'm like oh, no i can't do this but like with english i only learned the three tenses 
And like speaking to people who've learned English as a second language or a third language, there's so many more tenses that we aren't taught as, you know, English speakers. Yeah. 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 They, they historically exist and they're just not used anymore. Well, uh, they are used. With- they're just not used by, by, like, you know, especially not in America. Like I have a coworker. Well, she, she's older than me. Some of them aren't used she- at all anymore. Some of them are oh, used. Oh no, rarely. a lot of them aren't used at all. <laughs> Um, but she's talking about like when she was in school, like, you know, they learned all the tenses and she's like, she was like surprised that I only learned the three tenses. I learned past, present and future. And she's like, well, what about future, um, present? Like with the ads? Yeah. Yeah. What, can yeah, you do that one perfect, more time? Future perfect. And all, exactly. All <laughs> Cause like I had a, um, someone on the internet trying to like quiz me in different, um, tenses. He's trying to say that I'm not an English, native English speaker myself. I'm like, I do speak English natively. It's just, I've never learned those tenses. Like that's yeah. not taught in our schools because we don't yeah. really and that's, pay that much attention that's to it. One to be of the honest. things that I'm aiming for with the you know with with the idea behind uh, the you know the Asper language family, one of the things I'm aiming for in that respect is um, to make it so that uh, that these these less common forms of something can be learned later in life. That you can start out with the basics. That, you know, like, I mean, the, the, it's designed to be learned by babies, you know, so so that so that you don't have to wait until you're like old enough to learn to talk or old enough to learn to read that you can start right away. Uh, <clears throat> for example, the, the word ga. It's a very vague word. It's intended to be baby speak, so to, so to speak, baby talk. Um, and ga basically um, it's it's a vague word sort of meaning like like um go ahead or your turn or like talk communicate it's it's a general communications word and it's about i think it's probably like the most vague word in uh <clears throat> that's built into uh esperanto spare and as uh, uh like a key component of of the esperanto of the esper language family um <clears throat> but then there there are other words in that same set uh for example ka means please or basically it's a request word and again it's it's a little a little bit vague but that's on purpose because the english word please um comes from the phrase if it pleases you meaning like if it'll make you happy go ahead and do it um you know that's not really much of a request it's more like an offer and and uh you know when you translate please into some other language um well, for example, in Spanish, it becomes por favor, by favor, meaning like do this for free. You know, do this as a yeah. favor. Don't, you know, don't charge me for it. And, uh, you know, so so you take something that means do this if it pleases you and translate th- that into do this without charging me for it. And you've changed the meaning. Um, but, of course, you know, when people say please or they say por favor, they don't mean those things. That's just where it came from. And, uh, you know, so well, we, a lot of words have also lost like their in, original meaning, like, like, yeah, uh, exactly. please and por favor. Um, exactly. And they've evolved. And so, like I said, in, in a spare ka fills that, that general purpose. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, again, you're welcome in English or in Spanish, de nada, de nada means of nothing. And that's way different than you're welcome. You're welcome is like, you know, what you're welcome to it. Uh, See, a lot of people, a lot of people are, a lot of things where I was trying to learn Spanish, de nada, they basically translate it as being like, no worries or no problem. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and apparently people thing. get offended if you say no worries or no problem. Cause I say that quite often. I've had like people who are older than me get mad at me. Like, what do you mean? It's a problem. Like, I mean, it's like, yeah. Well, that's the same. Bad. It's like, it's same. okay. You don't have to apologize for it. You don't have to tell me like, it's, well, that's the fine. thing is you can offend someone by saying de nada because, you know, if somebody's trying to tell you how important something was to them and, you know, they're, they're you know, telling you, you know, gracias tanto, you know, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. And and you tell them de nada, you might, is in, in essence, be transferring the meaning of what you think was so important was nothing. Yes, that, that too. And also people think like it means like whenever I say no problem, they mean yeah, like, well, you meant that you had to do it. I'm like, well, yeah, it's my job, but it was no problem to do it. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I said in, in, in a spare, I mean, you can, you can take those words from those languages if you want and bring them into a spare and use them, you know, in, in that particular language in the Asper family. Um, but there's no need because there's a set of simple words that are set to, to use that, to serve that purpose um, in a more generalized sense without, without having to carry those very specific meanings. They're just politeness words. And so ka is the politeness word for a request. And uh, ta is the, the politeness word for um, thank you. And then da is like the politeness word for the equivalent of you're welcome. My roommate's dog came in my room. Hi, Missy. Um, uh, back to your thing on um, the word ga. Um, that also brings me to another thing when people are trying to learn like a second language is that they'll try to, um, you know, compare it to things that they're used to. Like ga could you know, technically be com um, compared to go on or continue, you mentioned. Mm. So people are like, oh, well, that's basically like go. It's just different. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it's, it's intentionally made similar to several no, words in several different languages and of course there's going to be languages that it's going to be similar to like something that means just the opposite or whatever these things you know they're bound to happen uh but like the word da for example uh one of the things that was taken into consideration uh, in coming up with the word da to, to be used as like a you're welcome is in esperanto um the word da is used as as a um, a preposition uh, meaning like a portion of something um, or, or an amount of something. And uh, the idea there being if, you know, somebody says ta, meaning thank you, you say da, meaning like, you know, a portion of the thanks back to you. And so there is some meaning, um, there is some meaning there derived from Esperanto. But at the same time, there's also consideration of the, uh, the Russian word da, meaning yes. So somebody says thank you, you know, ta, you say da, as in like, yes, thank you too. <laughs> ah, makes sense. So, and, and but an another one, one that makes a good memory aid for that, and this was purely by coincidence, but just an observation. Um, you know, you know how people say, you know, people request something, they say, you know, can I have that? And they're like, you didn't say the magic word, meaning, you know, you didn't say please. Give it now. Oh, wait, you mean please. Sorry. Yeah, 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 the magic <laughs> word, give it now. Okay, well, ka being the magic word, um, ka is of course followed by ta and da. So say the magic word. What comes next? Now. Ta da. <laughs> ta da. <laughs> Please don't eat the cat. Sorry, Nate, roommate's dog. <laughs> don't eat the cat. <laughs> yes, probably not a good idea to eat the cat. <laughs> Carrier. She doesn't. She's yeah. okay with like two of my cats, but like my younger cat, she does not like her like at all. She'll chase. Well, I guess she likes her. She just chases her because you know, small cat likes likes to chase her. Yeah, that's yeah. Nice. She likes to chase a small cat because it's it's small cat will run and not try to fight her like the other two will. Hmm. Yeah. Speaking of a uh, small cat, that's you know, like I said earlier, when I meant I meant to put kitten, catito, and I put uh, instead. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I meant to put, yeah, I meant to put Catito, and instead I put Cateto, which is a small cat. Um, Again, we would, none of us would know except for you. We'd be like, oh, that's that makes sense. That's exactly yeah. what he meant to do. Kind of like the 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 ah on the dog. Yeah, it's it's like the it's it's basically the equivalent of the Spanish diminutive eat. Um, you know, like like in uh, gato would be uh, gatito would be uh, like a little cat like un gatito. <laughs> in uh, in. In Esperanto, in 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 Esperanto, uh, et is the the suffix that serves that purpose. So, bringing that into the Esper family, then of course, if I'm speaking Espanol Esper, um, if I say uh, un gato, and un by the way um, is is actually an Esper number, just like in just like the Spanish number, uh, <clears throat> but but you know, so that one works both ways. But un gato, uh, if if I wanted to make, you know, the, the gatito it, in Esperanto spare, it would be gateto. But then you can do that with any noun, any, any word at all, really, um, that you can, you can make a diminutive of a noun, of a verb, of an adjective, of an adverb or whatever. 
and so you know in Spanish you can do that with with any any noun or any adjective in English um, <clears throat> you can do it with some nouns and not others <laughs> well, that's true you know the, the 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 English diminutive is usually just like adding a y on the end or something like that um, it's it's not a hundred percent consistent um, sometimes it's chopping a word in half and adding a y on what's left of it and there's there is something like that in Esperanto as as well and that's actually taken from the Russian um, <clears throat> for example uh, um, patro is the uh, Esperanto word for father um, the Esperanto word for mother is patrino. No, where that comes from is the in suffix in Esperanto is a feminine suffix. Now, when Esperanto first came out, there was no masculine suffix. There was only a feminine suffix. So anytime you wanted the word to be masculine, you had to use the default form, which means the default form had to double as both the masculine and the epicene. Paul Just wants to know if you have a website for your, uh, for, um, Esperanto. Right. I have had websites for it in the past. I don't have any of my websites anymore. I've published things in various places online, and over the years, um, sites that I've had things published on have shut down and disappeared, and um, <clears throat> stuff has been erased off of them and all kinds of stuff. So I've yeah, had that I, happen. I really got to get it published in physical book format because it just lasts longer. I uh, mean, if you, I, I do think like it's not that expensive to do self-publishing. Well, that's digital publishing through Amazon. If you if you did that, yeah, I've 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 got it in the works, and actually, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna have to spend a lot of time on that. And I've been thinking about you know maybe doing some of that actually in videos, and just you know I don't know about you know if I should record them and then play them or live stream. Uh, while I'm actually doing the editing or whatever, but you know, just because it's easier for me to do something for someone else than for myself, and I still a lot of like people writing, when they're doing, doing editing, they'll do like the editing stuff on Twitch and live stream that, and then they'll do like the finished video after they edit it on here on YouTube. Uh, I've noticed people do that a lot. Interesting thought. Yeah, I because I that's what I tried, tried doing because I I do art and I'm <clears> like um well. I was trying to figure out how to do the live streaming first, and I did it first on Twitch, um, and you know, did that, and I post my videos here on YouTube once I finish, at, um, not editing them, once I finish adding music to it. I've also considered, like, you know, if I do live stream, um, I mean, I mean, you know, I would like to get help from other people, input and stuff like that, um, and ideally, I'd, I'd like to credit people that have helped, but. You know, if I if I start live streaming and I end up with all kinds of different people, you know, one helps out a little bit, one helps out a little bit, another one helps out a little bit. Am I going to end up with, you know, a few hundred names I've got to put in there and some people using names that aren't their real name and nobody would know who they were anyway. And, you know, so so I'm not sure what's the best way to do any of this stuff. But in the end, I'm just going to have to go ahead and do it and just know that I'm not going to be doing it the best way because I don't know what the best way is. For that, you could ask want. people, um, basically, you know, because a lot of people, they'll help with something, but they don't want to be thanked. Like, they don't want their name out there. You can ask people, you know, to sign something or to put something like, you know, hey, if you want to be recognized, tell me how to what your name you want to use. And can I say your name on air? Or can I just say, you know, various other people to talk about you since you don't want your name on the Internet hmm. as well? Because, you know, like a lot of people, they'll have, um, well, YouTube was doing it for a while because they're part of Google. They're trying to make people use their real names for everything. It's like, I'm not putting my real name out there. You can forget about that. That's that's my name. No can has. Yeah, I'm just looking on uh, Wikibooks. There used to be on a spare page on, on uh, Wikibooks, and that seems to not be there anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they do purge a lot of stuff. So, yeah, like I said, there's been a lot of stuff out there. I've, I've had, you know, quite a few things I've published over the years. And, uh, you know, stuff that I've, I've saved on hard drives that I don't have the hard drives anymore or the computers that the hard drives are on anymore. Um, you know, things I've saved on disks that I don't have the disks anymore. 
Um, it's just, you know, over the years, it's it's been loss after loss after loss. But um, at the same time, you know, I figure... <clears throat> See, the reason uh, the I do that, put stuff really on nice. different things, is because I have a tendency of deleting my stuff. So if I put it on different things, there's always going to be that one thing I forget to delete. So that way, once I'm done deleting stuff, <laughs> I start getting mad at myself. like, oh, fuck, I just deleted all my work. There's that one thing that still has it. Hmm. Not that good about doing that with my writing anymore, but I'm not, I do that with my art. So my art's on a bunch of different places. So that way, whatever I you know, go on a deleting spree, it's going to be somewhere. Yeah, well... I've, I've lost so much of things I've intended to publish in the past. Um, I've had, I've had several books basically, basically all done editing and everything ready for publishing and then lost the whole thing, backed up copies and all. And so I do have more of a tendency now to keep stuff in several places, but then I have the problem of I'm not any good at keeping track of which one was the most up to date one. And so then when I go to edit it, it's like, am I editing? the newest one or am i editing one of the one of the older ones i've only written one book and i lost that because my stepbrother stole my uh usb drive and i didn't have any backups of it because i didn't know they know any better back then so yeah when when i the what i'm what i'm hoping to publish sometime soon um it should have at least at least um at least a chapter on the anglish spare language i had wanted to put in um, several different Aspire languages, and um, I, I, you know, I kind of decided it would be better to just concentrate on that one for now and on the basic concept behind it. I don't know if that's a good way to do it or not, but again, like I said, I don't know the best way. I've just got to do something. I would recommend <laughs> changing the name and trying to separate it from um, Esperanto because of how you know adverse they are to languages that are derivative of it yeah, so i would recommend you know, trying to distance yourself from that so that way maybe you can get more people to help because you're not probably gonna get much help from that community since they're so um hard-headed yeah. about everything I'm, I'm not gonna worry about it. it it is what it is and you know i mean <clears throat> like i said in in the long run um <clears throat> i don't think it's anywhere near the best that we can do anyway i i really think that if we want to do a language right, um, that we should start out from from something like you know set theory to you know look at at, at um, <clears throat> you know look at at basic mathematics and set theory and stuff like that and and start start by building a language where babies could learn set theory, and I think we'll be be doing a lot better from there because uh, for example the the word b. The word, the the English verb to be, um, <clears throat> it's so vague. It, it can mean so many different things depending on the context. And th there's actually a, a version of English out there called E prime, um, where basically the idea is that you use English without the word to be, and it's hard to do. It takes practice, but it's so much clearer. Because, you know, if you say, for example, um, the ball is red, do you mean, again, if you take out all of our experiences and you're just trying to analyze what's meant by a sentence of that form, do you mean that ball and red are the same thing? You know, if the ball is red, does that also mean red is the ball? You know, do you mean that, that the ball is a subset of red? You know that it is a thing that is red or that it is a part of all of what is red there are just so many different ways that you can take that to be so if you just throw well, that's that out just entirely, also, that's also just taking it too literally though it, if you're try, thinking to it that much but yeah i get how like if you take out your experiences um you wouldn't think that you know it's describing the color of the ball you like you know some people could think it's like the ball and the you know red or the same yeah. thing or yeah, They're are both. they equal? Is one a subset of the other one? Is one a superset of the other one? Is one a proper subset? Or is it, you know, are they both the same set? And so that's why I say, you know, if you start with something like set theory, I think you'd have a, a better grounding point. But I, but this is something I don't think I should be deciding either. I think this is something that, you know, linguists and scientists and artists and, you know, people from a, a diverse set of different fields you know, should be getting together and saying, you know, let's experiment with some of these things 
and uh, you know learn from it and then build something from there. And you know, but but yeah, I mean, if if you want a computer to be able to understand human speech and to understand it well, um, you've got to be able to work around such things. Um, <clears throat> now, once a computer has a way of getting enough life experience and getting enough experience talking with people and looking stuff up on the internet and whatever else, maybe we can get around some of that. But um, as I was saying earlier, you know, it, the idea behind despair from the ground up, it's meant to be able to handle uh, both vague and precise. And <clears throat> that's something I think needs to be acknowledged in human communications a little more, a little more explicitly is the fact that we do need to be able to, to communicate things clearly, but we also do need to be able to communicate things vaguely. You can't just pick one or the other and call it good enough for everything. Well, you also mentioned that you designed Aspire to be um, basically learned from by babies. Does yeah. that also mean that it's not going to be something that like an adult can comprehend as well? Kind of like um, you know, um, oh no, not at all. Common um, core math, basically. It's like only children can understand it, and the people that are teaching it, bas basically. No, no, not not at all. It's 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 meant to be both. The idea is the idea is to make it so that a baby can learn um, as early as possible. Um, at least how to communicate general ideas and how to understand general ideas so that basically an adult could speak a subset of the language to a baby and the baby could understand that subset of the language and speak that subset of the language uh, early on in their development um, and to be able to speak more precisely would, would mean having to add more stuff to it oh, okay so that makes sense. it's kind of like kind of like uh you know when when people talk about evolution and they well, my need... other example was going to be um the song new math by uh tom lair what, which what song uh new math by tom lair he is a mathematician sure who um that. he's a mathematician that turned to basically um comedy writing he's he's a mathematician again he teaches math at a university but yeah, I'm a, sure um, I've heard that, and I can't place what what was the the context or the lyrics, but I'm I'm pretty sure I've heard it. <laughs> um, it's an old old song, so it's basically like they're like one of the earlier changes they're doing to how they taught math in schools, and you talking about how mm. ridiculous. Basically, it's so simple that only a child can do it. Yeah, well, um, what they what they were referring to as new math was basically um, the algebraic ordering of operators. Yeah, and um, the reason the reason that was done is because there was no standard on it before that. So if you wrote like one plus two times three plus four times five plus six times seven plus eight, um, <clears throat> a person a person might do that do that from left to right, or they might do it from right to left. Or they might just start in the middle somewhere, and you'll get different answers depending on what order you do it in. And some people would teach it one way, and other people would teach it another way. And so if a person did it the way they taught it, their students would understand them. But then students of somebody who did it a different way and taught it a different way would get it completely wrong. Uh, what's this Iron Charioteer is asking... Uh, have you ever seen a Spanish speaking mother give birth to a Portuguese speaking baby? Oh, um, that's great. I haven't, I haven't watched a lot of people give birth and I haven't yet seen a baby born able to speak. So no, um, haven't seen that yet. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, the language of the, the language of the parents, um, is inherited by the child uh, through learning, not through genetics. And so if the child is removed from that environment before they have a chance to inherit the parent's language and they're placed in an environment where they will inherit some other language from someone other than their parents, they can still inherit a language from humanity, but it won't necessarily be the one of the family that they were born into um, or any of the ones of the family that they were born into. So, yeah, and this, this, 
this comes back to what I was starting to say a little while ago about when people talk about evolution and you know if they talk about evolution and they mean specifically biological evolution but they're not saying specifically biological evolution that is speaking in a more vague form they're being less precise and you can do that and get away with it provided the context is understood or assumed by people on both sides of the conversation or all sides of the conversation if you've got one person who's making that assumption and another one who's not or worse yet who's making a different assumption um, that can lead to miscommunication and <clears throat> so in the same sense you know um, if a baby uh, needs to be able to speak about evolution uh, chances are that baby's not going to need to speak specifically about reproductive biological evolution of populations um, because the baby isn't going to have all the context to talk about anything that's specific anyway uh, to be able to speak early on in life about change adding up which is all evolution is just the process of change accumulating that seems very essential to learning to understand the world around us as a starting point. <clears throat> you know, languages languages do evolve, and they are passed on from one person to another. Oh, um, yeah. And, and languages do reproduce, and they do diversify. <clears throat> you know, these these are all things that life forms do, and in in a sense, languages um, when they're doing such things can be considered living. As a matter of fact, uh, we tend to distinguish between living and dead languages. As living languages are languages that are currently in use, and dead languages are languages that have fallen out of use and are therefore basically no longer evolving. It makes me sad to think about like dead languages. It's like those are languages that basically, you know, will eventually be lost completely to time. Like not no necessarily. One... Well, it, true. That's true. You know, but I mean, Latin is considered a, Latin is considered a dead language, and it's still studied by a lot of people, and um, and it is still being used to contribute to living languages. Oh yeah, um, that's true. You know, especially in in science, because it's a dead language, they brought it into you know they brought it into usage in science. I mean, it was already being used in science when it was still a living language, mm -hmm. um, to the little extent that it was still living. I mean, it was already dying out, but um, <clears throat> because of the fact that it was considered a scholarly language, it got brought into science for that reason. And then later on, it was used it was um, used even more in science. With the emphasis being on, well, because this language is dead, we can pretty much expect the meanings of words not to change over time. And so it's a better language for naming things because we can take a descriptive name in Latin and, uh, you know, label something with that descriptive name. And even if it doesn't describe it really well, at least we don't have to worry about, you know, after 50 years, um, that that phrase won't mean the same thing anymore. Oh yeah, that's true. That's that's why I like whenever a lot of people are like, why do we use Latin for this anyways? Because language is, you know, <clears throat> not used very often anymore. So it's not like the language the you know, meaning of words gonna change. So the the name of that that scientific name of that's not gonna change really. It's gonna yeah. mean the same thing. An another another interesting example is modern Hebrew, which uh, you know, ancient Hebrew of course died out completely. Um <clears throat> Uh, Yiddish basically took its place. Um, you know, it, Hebrew evolved into Yiddish, and, uh, and you know they they weren't interchangeable to the point where like a Yiddish speaker could read ancient Hebrew and know what it said. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so uh, <clears throat> so from from uh, Hebrew writings that were associated with uh, with the Bible and the Torah. And from modern translations, I think, I think uh, the largest part of which was the King James version of the Bible. Um, that you know, they 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 looked at what these ancient Hebrew words appeared to mean based on modern translations of those writings, and reconstructed a Hebrew language from that. And that's where we got modern Hebrew from. So it's, um, <clears throat> of course, it's not ancient Hebrew. Um, but it is similar. It's kind of like, uh, 
like the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, you know, which they, they, they weren't exactly, you know, I mean, that's, that's of course, fiction as opposed to reality, but nonetheless, the concept being there that, uh, you know, they, they, they took what DNA they could find from some particular dinosaur and then filled in the gaps with something else. So it yeah. wasn't really bringing back the same thing, uh, but it was the closest they could get. It's a close approximation. Yeah, that's true. But also, well, I don't remember what I was going to say, so never mind. Really, Look really ironic. Too. Really, I, 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 well, I don't know. Irony is probably not the right word, but it is interesting, though, to think about the fact that that in the original Jurassic Park, um, there was mention of the possibility that dinosaurs and birds were closely related and that birds were actually descendants of dinosaurs, which we now know to be the case. <clears throat> and, well, you uh, know, like a lot of people were mocking uh, the movie for saying that too, though. Yeah, like yeah, I remember people like mocking them for that. The yeah, but but the really funny thing about it, though, is as it turns out, a lot of the dinosaurs in the original Jurassic Park should have had feathers on them, and they didn't know that because the fossils weren't good enough. Uh, they didn't have a clear enough fossil record to find out. Well, yeah, because feathers, feathers really don't really don't preserve all that well. Yeah, they don't preserve all that well. And so we do know now that uh, a lot of those dinosaurs were actually feathered dinosaurs. You know, there were avian therosaurs um, that had feathers and that were represented in, in Jurassic Park as, you know, like, like skinned or scaly, but no feathers. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and now they could have so easily fixed that in, in, you know, future releases of the movie and they still could. Because really, I mean, think about it. Um, they said that they were going to use what was it a a, a frog or something that, but a, a, an amphibian. They were going to use an amphibian or a reptile um, to fill in the missing genes. Yeah. Um, I forget which one, but but they weren't using a bird to fill in the missing genes. Now the closest relative to the closest living relative to dinosaurs would be birds. If they had used birds to fill in those genes, they might have got feathers. Well, so a lot of people, a lot of people <laughs> assume that the closest relatives to living to them now is like alligators and crocodiles and stuff like that, because you know they're still big animals. So, yeah. and you know, there's that assumption that close. they have scales. Yeah, those are somewhat close, but I mean, I, I'm just saying, you know, if you know, if they wanted to fix that in later renditions and, and you know, bring the feathers in, they could have had both feathered and non-feathered versions, and they could have made it so scientifically realistic by just saying, well, you know, these are the ones that we made, uh, you know, back before we had done enough genetic testing to find out what their closest relative was, and they don't have feathers because, you know, they got their extra genes from this thing. And here's the ones that we got that are, you know, closer to the original because, you know, we actually used bird genes to fill in the gaps yeah <laughs> well that and like you know you can also probably be really hard for like all the action in the movies but you know some people will say that you can go back and do edits in the movies using cgi now to actually put feathers on a lot of them so they could actually mm. change that in the movies too if they took the time to do it probably take a long ass time to do it but they probably could yeah, Iron Cherry Tear says yes. That was a reference to your evolution is ubiquitous theory. So yeah, I don't, Iron I don't know if you saw that. I I had a I, debate with Kent Hovind on that whether actually evolution is ubiquitous. So I have a question about that. Would you consider Old English and uh, you know current English to be completely different languages then, since you know they're so vastly different? When when did it turn from like Old English to New English? Like when was the cutoff point? If we're going to talk about evolution. Yeah, yeah. There, 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 that's just it. There wasn't. Yeah, exactly. But like you know, if, we, yeah. if someone today looked at old English, we wouldn't understand a single like much of yeah. it at all because yeah, it's so people, different. Most most English speakers have heard of old English and don't even really have a clue what it is. Um, you know, I, I would say probably the average English speaker thinks that you know the King James version of the Bible is written in old English. It isn't. No. That's that's Middle English, and uh, it's 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 kind of a modern Middle English. Well, the, um, the closest thing that, it, like, I've seen for, like, Old English was ac actually in cartoons and stuff. You know, they'll have, like, the the like the old scripts and stuff, and they'll have, like, the things, and it's, like, people, like, oh, I can't read that. I'm, like, that's because that's in Old English. Like, it's mm. legit English. It's just Old English. You <clears throat> uses a bunch of different stuff that we don't use these days. Yeah, Old English is, is pretty far from modern English, and, 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, we've got no audio recordings, so we don't really even know what Old English sounded like. Oh, we no. have ideas of what it sounded like, but we don't actually know. And I mean, if, if you if you built a time machine and you could only use it once and, you know, you could go back in time to where people actually spoke Old English, there's Dave no had way a question you could like prepare that. for that. What, what's that? Uh, Dave, like, are you aware of Dave, like, his critical question, questions thing? Like, he had a question about, like, if you could um, have a time machine that only goes um, back once, where would you go? Uh -huh. um, yeah, if I had a time machine that could only go back once, um, I probably would never use it. At least not for myself. Well, his questions are typically like you have to pick some things, and it was like some other oh. stipulations for the question as well. Yeah, um, well, uh, in that case, so. in that case, you know, if if that was going to be the case, I would probably, I would probably do it on a live stream, and uh, somewhere near the end of the live stream, I'd teleport myself back in time to near the beginning of the live stream, because <laughs> at least that would be interesting. <laughs> just to, just to, just to mess with people, it's like surprise. So, you know, like I could have maybe like an hour long conversation with myself <laughs> before, you know, going back in time. I don't, I don't like myself enough when, uh, to have a conversation for, with myself for that long. I, I couldn't do it. I'd get yeah. tired of myself for like after a while. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't find it all that terribly interesting either, but it would be at least entertaining for other people. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure someone would find it entertaining at least. Yeah. Um. It yeah, would enter, it would entertain somebody. <clears throat> that's true. I've actually thought about doing that just as like a like an April Fool's joke or something, you know, to just um, like script the whole thing and um, <laughs> you know <laughs> do it, but not really. <laughs> See, for that, like I, I you, there's there used to be like a joke about doing going into like a um, like a grocery store or something like once a week or something the same time every day. And like asking a question and like shit, it didn't work. And then like finally like go in there and ask them, you know, like what year? It was like what year is it? That's just what it was. And when they say the year, like or the date, you act like oh, yes, it worked. It's it finally worked. You act like you're from the future, just to see if they believe you. <laughs> to mess with people. Mm. Yeah, that could be interesting. It, it could. Because there's always going to be that one person that's going to believe believe you, at least. Cause... But yeah, I, I do want to add. I do want to add. A, you know, I started work on it, and I lost where the work I started went. So I'm going to have to start it again. But um, I do want to add a chapter to my book um, near the beginning. On um, well, there's a, a few things I want to add, but I do want to put a full um, theory of evolution in there. And I don't mean a theory of biological evolution. I mean a theory of evolution. Um, I've <clears throat> I've also kind of wanted to make a, uh, you know some videos on non-biological evolution. Maybe you know maybe uh, you know one one thing I'd kind of like to do, and I, I might schedule that for like tomorrow or something. Who knows? But um, you know I, I'd like to make a video. Where I basically go on go on the internet and run searches for stuff about evolution and just ignore all of the biological stuff and just look at anything else because you know biological evolution is something that gets talked about a lot, but then when people try to talk about evolution, and they're not trying to talk about biological evolution, it too often gets assumed that what they're talking about is biological evolution, and there goes an opportunity to talk about you know evolution itself <clears throat> i mean like languages don't evolve in the same way that's that um living species of of biology do well the thing about that is that if you just look up evolution you're going to find mostly stuff about biological evolution so you would have to like put you know some stipulations <clears throat> on it you would have to put in like evolution of language or something to at least specify what you're looking for well here let's let's do do this okay just evolution uh let's see there's evolution wikipedia uh videos of evolution um uh, let's see evolution dictionary 
theory of evolution, that's probably biology. Uh, evolution media, that's that's a company apparently. Um, here, do a YouTube search. An interesting way to do it is if you just do like like that. Um, like what? Just oh, you can't. Can you see that? Is it showing on the screen? Okay. Yes, it is. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm on my phone, yeah. so I'm having to look at it on the um, oh, on okay. my laptop. Yeah. If you just do like E V O L, um, you'll you'll get you'll get um, suggestions, evolve, yeah. and evolving and evolution and stuff like that. But you also get a bunch of these things that are like the word love spelled backward and stuff like that. Um, yeah. There's also like a um a health food company called Evolve, which is you know love backwards. So. Uh, or you can do evolution of. And that's a little more specific. And here, the evolution of Haley, Haley Pham and her content, uh, evolution of music, uh, evolution of Godzilla, evolution of Pennywise, evolution of dance, evolution of Chucky, uh, evolution of girls groups, evolution of Super Mario games. Now, notice I just put evolution of. I didn't even have to specify, you know, other than biology. And so far, none of these are biology. Well, did you uh, just do, try just with evolution without the the of part of it? Um, not and just see now, if that but changes it. Oh, it will. Uh, but you'll still get some of that. Okay, <clears throat> uh, that's Pearl good. Jam, do the evolution. Where do humans come from? Okay, that's biological, obviously. How evolution works. Notice they're not saying how biological evolution works. Well, that is good. Implied. So that's awesome. It's implied. <clears throat> uh, someone says I broke evolution with an auto clicker in ecosystem so that's apparently in a video game and again probably talking about biological evolution but in that case a simulation of biological evolution uh, evolution it's a thing again probably biological uh, what is yeah, evolution that's in a game from, biological. The, from the um the video that's pretty neat though no here's evolution of chucky evolution of godzilla uh what is the evidence for evolution again probably biological Again, it usually gets assumed, but when you know, when you assume it instead of instead of expressing it, you 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 close off the possibility of clear communication beyond that scope. <clears throat> uh, let's see, common misconceptions about evolution. I don't know, but again, probably biological. Probably. Um, uh, there's a there's an album named Evolution. Evolution. From ape to man, which is that's kind of humorous because, you know, we're still apes. <laughs> oh well, if you talk to like Christians, they do not like it when you call us when you say that humans or animals or apes. Oh my God, they will yeah, lose their know. shit if you say that. Well, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> the the definition of apes used to exclude humans explicitly. Why am I not surprised? You know, and they did that on purpose. Because because there were already apes other than humans that were counted as human in many cultures and in many languages. Um, so, you know, like, for example, orangutans were considered humans by a lot of people. Um, you know, so 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 they they made a definition of apes that excluded humans on purpose. And that has since been dropped in science. They don't use that anymore. Apes include humans explicitly. <laughs> so yeah well, scientifically that, that, yeah that, but like yeah, if you yeah. talk to like a lot of christians and other religions they'll they'll get pissed off <clears throat> if you say that humans are apes yeah well if they want to argue the case about monkeys that's a little easier because monkeys are you know the monkey group is paraphyletic um like i said apes apes were not originally paraphyletic they were monophyletic and it, they were made paraphyletic intentionally uh, because of the fact that people didn't want to uh, acknowledge the fact that humans are apes. Um, monkeys, on the other hand, uh, you know, ended up just sort of coincidentally grouped into two separate groups of old world monkeys and new world monkeys. And, uh, and their ancestors, which of course would also be monkeys, weren't considered monkeys because they weren't old world monkeys and they weren't new world monkeys. But if you count old world monkeys and new world monkeys and their last shared common ancestor and all of the descendants of that last shared common ancestor, then humans are monkeys. 
that's true. So. Um, I, I just I just know about the whole um, humans aren't apes thing because my family lost their shit when someone said that um, humans are apes. Uh, yeah, it happens. <laughs> like they lost their shit whenever I was talking about um, you know, the scientific name for humans, like the whole genus and all that stuff. Like, no, we're not. Like, yeah, we are. Like, it doesn't branch off until this part of it's. Up until this well, part, we're the same thing. If you if you define ape, okay, just doing that on Google. Define ape. Uh, let's see what Google says. A large primate that lacks a tail, including uh, the gorilla, chimpanzee, orangutans, and gibbons. See also great ape and gibbon. Okay. Now they didn't mention including humans, no. but notice the description. Um, it says a large primate. Humans are primates. Lacks a tail. Humans lack a tail. <laughs> that's that's it for their definition. They just they just included us right there, uh, without having to explicitly do so. Um, it says also see also great ape. Now great ape is a subset of ape, and humans are also great ape. So if we go over to that one, it says a large ape of the of a family closely related to humans, including gorillas, orangutan, and chimpanzees, but excluding the gibbons. An anthropoid ape. Now, there again, they didn't explicitly say humans are included, but they did say a large family of a large family, uh, large, sorry, large ape of a family closely related to humans. So yeah, closely related human, to humans, though, but not yeah. humans. Well, humans are closely related to humans, so we I mean, are, we are again, very closely related, related to humans. That. That's true. We are very closely related to humans. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, you only have to go back two generations to know that humans uh, evolved from apes because, you know, your parents were apes and your grandparents were apes. And you're not you're not the same as your parents or your grandparents. So there you go. <laughs> I mean, I'd be kind of worried if I was the same as my parents, to be honest. But, yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, that's sexual reproduction for you. It happens rather quickly. <laughs> And here, let's see. Um, oh, yeah. Here, here you go. Okay. Um, great apes. Over on the side thing here, it says uh, hominidae. That's, that's the, that's the uh, taxonomic classification of great apes, the scientific name, hominidae. And under hominidae, uh, under, or hominidae, if, I suppose, depending which phonetics you want to use, uh, under that, Here's lower classifications. In other words, uh, um, you know, included within hominidae. Notice orangutan is one of those included in there. And homininae is another one included in there. And look what they have a picture of under homininae. Yep. African apes. I mean, you know, this particular subset of African apes is humans or hominids or hominins in this case. Um, yeah, the great apes are hominids, and then the um, hominins <clears throat> are a subcategory of hominids. And uh, if we go to lower classifications of that, we'll get uh, hominini. Yeah, hominini. And if we go to lower classifications of hominini, um, oh, do they have lower classifications? No, they're they're not showing them. But uh, I'm trying to be immature, and hominini just amuses me. It sounds yeah. adorable. Homo is, an, is a lower classification of hominini. So if we click on homo over here, we get the, the genus. Um, is it? Oh, well, oh, they're showing. No, they're showing hominini as a, classific a lower classification of homo. So that would be why. I got that in the wrong order. And, I've also uh, seen people get mad about being called homo as well. Yeah, actually, um, if you're familiar with uh, Aaron Ra's series on uh, systematic classification of life, um, I had suggested to him at one point in time, because he puts a, in a lot of the episodes of that, there's 50 episodes to it in total. And in mm -hmm. a lot of the episodes, he, he puts a little a little pun or a little jab at, at, at the, the end um, regarding whatever category, whatever class he's working on. Like, you know, like, like you know, do you have enough backbone? Do you have the backbone to admit you're a vertebrate? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and... Uh, so I, I, I suggested to him at one point in time, he didn't use it. Um, he, he did say he wanted to, but he, he never ended up using it. I suggested to him that um, 
<clears throat> when he got to the genus uh, homo, that he should ask, are you man enough to admit you're a homo? That would be funny. There would be people that would get offended by it, though. I'm pretty sure it's probably why yeah, he didn't use it. That's probably why he didn't use it. Cause that was a little too edgy. But still. <laughs> but, like, yeah, there's a lot of people that get offended by that. They're like, I'm not a homo. Yes, you are. That's that's part of your classification scientifically is that that's what you are. Yeah. So I'm not saying that you're that, you know, your sexuality or anything. That's just, like, your classification scientific. <clears throat> yeah. And we're also eukaryotes. And yep. we, you know, we share that in common with elephants and pine trees. It's that, that was a, a funny one that, you know, um, when uh, Aaron Ra asked Kent Hovind to come up with two, two different species, you know, two different species that, that scientists would say are closely related and that, you know, he would say is, are not related at all. And I remember the, that. That was hilarious. The best he could come up with is an elephant and a pine tree, as if that's likes, something that scientists would say are closely related. Yeah, he likes to joke about that. That um, Hoban does. He's like, I'm not related to an elephant or a pine tree, like, dude. Yes, you are. You're also related to a fucking banana. So. Yeah, yeah, and he also <clears throat> he also doesn't seem to be able to keep track of it. I and I I'm pretty sure he's doing it on purpose. But he doesn't seem to be able to keep track of the fact that evolution only works in one direction. You know that it's it's not like it's not like um, <clears throat> it's not like just because elephants and pine trees shared a common ancestor that therefore elephants are ancestors of pine trees or pine trees are ancestors of elephants. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I'm pretty sure he's. Um purposefully misunderstanding it and yeah. just you know tries to say it like to you know be funny yes. and seems to misrepresent like it on purpose because i will give kent hoven one thing he's a really great speaker yeah yeah he's he's uh well within the limitation of the of the speaking he does which all seems to be well rehearsed well, yes, but like subjectively, like you know, for stuff that you'd look for, and like someone who's a good speaker, he he does inflection. He's he's very animated. He's very engaging. Yeah. He's good at it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I do have I do have some curiosity though with regard to would he come off as a good speaker uh, on something that he's not prepared for? I don't at think all. he would because a, a lot of um, what his you know things that he seems to be really good at is because he's he's practiced in it because you'll notice whenever someone like does try to get him or someone does get him off script or something he's not familiar with he fumbles a bit he's not as he's not as engaging or you know as great at it as he would be for something he's very familiar with and practiced on yeah that that was one thing that i i very much caught him off guard um you know when it came to the evolution discussion because he was he was expecting that all he would have to do is bring up things other than life evolving and you know and 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 there he just won the conversation because uh you know because modern evolutionary theory doesn't account for all, all of that well um you know the problem is modern biological evolutionary theory doesn't have to account for that stuff because it's about biology and if you recognize the fact that that's about biology and not just about evolution, then, you know, that sort of explains why it's talking about biology. Yeah. You know, and, and if you want to understand biological evolution, there are at least two things you have to understand, biology and evolution. Well, evolution is the easy part. I wish more people would figure that out. Evolution is simple to understand. Biological evolution is hard to understand because biology is hard to understand. If you fully understand biology, you've come a long way toward understanding biological evolution. But if you don't understand evolution, you can't understand the biological evolution. Because it's a subset. And that's where most people make their mistakes. Sadly, most people are making their mistake in understanding biological evolution, not in their understanding of biology, but in their understanding of evolution. And if we would just teach evolution outside of biology, that wouldn't happen. 
Well, then you'd have to have, find out, you know, where in the curriculum you would have to you, you would have to teach biology. Everywhere. Um, well, yeah, everywhere. But <clears throat> you know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. History history is taught in pretty much every subject. Now, history is my worst subject, but I still have to deal with it. Uh, you know, I, I've I've had to learn. Uh, you know, history with regard to computer languages. I've had yeah. to learn history with regard to computer hardware. You know, mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff like that that I've had to deal with because, you know, you can't get away from it. No. Oh, yeah. Whenever, me, I would... whenever I was in college for web design, like they were like having us, you know, learn the evolution of that. And I'm like, um, exactly. and the history of it. And I'm like, what is this to do? Like, I just want to learn the uh, code. Like, I don't care about this part of it. But exactly what you just said. That's what I was going to say. I would rather learn the evolution of it than the history of it, because to me, that's more important. Well, and also like the, the evolution of it would, you know, t tell you why it does certain things. That's true. Right. Instead of, you know, just like, well, before it did this and we don't do that anymore and just drop it right. at that. It's like, and the thing why is, do we when, learn to do that? When you focus on it from a history point of view, then it's a question of what things were recorded. You know, it's a question of what, what history was, was recorded. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is completely irrelevant to the stuff that you're trying to the subject you're trying to learn. I mean, true. you know, for example, uh, you know, you don't have to know who Charles Babbage is to understand how a computer works. You know, it's good. It's I don't know not, who that is. It's not necessary. You, you don't you don't have to know, you know, um, you, you don't have to know who, who any of the people were. Now, is it nice to know? Sure. You know, it's trivia, but it's nice to know. But you don't have to know who any of the people were that were involved in any of it. What you do have to know is, um, for example, uh, when someone talks about a bite, what do they mean by that? And if you're reading an older book where it meant something else, what might it mean? You know, I mean, the evolution of these things is much more important than the history. And by the evolution of it, I mean two things. The evolutionary path that it took, which is a subset of the history and also um, the way that it evolved and therefore the ways that it can evolve or at least a subset of the ways that it can evolve because because certain things can evolve in certain ways and so if you understand how something has evolved then you understand ways that it can evolve and biology doesn't have the same restrictions on how it can evolve as say for example um, the evolution of a mathematical formula as you're solving it in you know say algebra you know you take a mathematical formula and, and you you make certain changes to it and a, a chain of changes evolves it into a solution of a certain type that's evolution as well but it has completely different restrictions than biological evolution and of course what those changes are depends on or what those restrictions are depends on what kinds of changes can happen that's that's the you know the main the main difference there now in biology you've got <clears throat> what kinds of changes can happen and then you've got you know um what can allow those changes to pass on or what can prevent those changes from being passed on i apparently need Hmm? Did your audio drop? You, you stopped in the middle of a sentence. My internet's being weird. I'm sorry. Um, I need to um, go because internet and also um, my feeling overlord is letting me know that it's time to play fetch, apparently. All right. She well, deserves I should, attentions. I should probably, we've been at this for over two hours now. Yeah, I should probably end this anyway. Um, if you want to hang around backstage just for a moment, I'd appreciate it. Um, I, no I don't think anybody else is going to jump in here, so um, I'll go ahead and end this one and say goodbye to everybody. And um, <clears throat> like I said, uh, you know, set up set up that other one sometime soon for uh, you know a talk on on uh, non biological evolution, and you know maybe I can look at some of those, uh, do a search like I just did there, and, and look at some of the some of the videos that come up and. Just you know, go through some of the things. What are they? There's a 
evolution of dance video. The only um, thing about doing that is, um, you know, since it's on YouTube, you'll have to be careful about whether or not the other people have music on their video. Because if their video has music, uh, then you'll get copyright yeah, that's a good stri point. striked. Yeah, that's a it. good point. Stop it right away if it's if it's playing music. I'll have to keep that in mind. Yeah, but you know, but even even just looking at what some of the things are. Um, and just, just to, you know, talk a little bit about them and maybe I can get, you know, someone to come on and, and, you know, give some of their thoughts on it as well. But, um, you know, this, this is stuff, like I said, I've, I've, I've thought about it a lot over time. I've, I've, you know, done some formal work in, uh, you know, formulating, uh, sort of generalized theory of evolution. Um, I've got to get the whole thing, you know, out and published and that'll be one of one of a bunch of stuff planned in, in the, the book I'm working on. So um, we'll see how that turns out or if I ever manage to finish it. Uh, but, you know, the way I look at it, it's never really going to be finished because there's always room for it to evolve more. So somewhere along the way, I've just got to call it good enough. Anyway, um, going to go ahead and uh, end the broadcast. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, showing up and... Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, I hope you'll consider doing so. Bye.